Welcome to the 2018 edition of the Sailing Champions League. This year, we kick off in beautiful Portochevo for the first semi-final of the season, before moving on to St. Petersburg in Russia, and then the final in San Moritz, Switzerland. With over 32 teams from all over the world, this season is shaping up to be the most competitive we've ever seen in the Sailing Champions League. Welcome to the final day of the semi-final in Portochevo, hosted by Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. And my name is Andy Rice, and joining me for the commentary again today is Mark Corky Rhodes. And we have a corker of a day lined up, don't we, Corky? Oh, it's going to be spectacular. The breeze is up a little bit further around towards the east. Uh, teams, the points are really tight at the top of the table. We're going to have a, a spectacular day of racing. Uh, so there is a little bit more breeze today. They're going to have to watch out for the, for the hoists and, and the drops on, on the spinnakers on this short course racing. So um, slight change in tempo. Um, but in, in another sense, they've, they've just got to keep on grinding through these final few races. Can't afford any slip-ups. No races that you can throw out here. You've got to count everything that you do. No, exactly. Every single race counts. Every single point matters. So you've got to battle that bit all the way down to the line. Uh, there's no discard, so it is just an accumulation of all of the points. That will be your final points at the end of it. And so the slip-ups now, it's been a, a lot of races, some long days on the water. And so it'll be interesting to see the mental and physical fatigue of the sailors and uh, who's, who's able to keep, uh, keep their head clear, their mind clear, and um, be able to focus on the next coming races. Well, looking at this drone shot, you can see why people come to the Costa Smeralda. Let's take a more in-depth look at this wonderful venue. Semi-final one of the Sailing Champions League 2018 takes centre stage at the prestigious Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. Situated in Portocevo on the northern coast of Italy's idyllic island and beautiful holiday destination Sardinia, this venue greets sailors with warm breeze and crystal clear water. We do believe that uh, many people is coming here sailing because uh, the place uh, and the venue is very unique in the world uh, with the, the constant uh, permanent uh, sailing from uh, western areas. Our regattas are pretty famous also for the mistral that are normally blowing here. Today, for example, we have 12 to 14 knots and the forecast is to maintain this uh, uh, kind of wind for at least a couple of days. With more than 50 years of club history, the Yacht Club Costa Smeralda looks back with well-deserved pride on its hosting of countless world-class regattas, including now, for the fourth time, the Sailing Champions League. Well, Corky and I are sitting in the bowels of that wonderful um, uh, clubhouse of the Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. It really is an incredible building. Um, I have to say, I'd rather be out on the water, Corky, but um, we will get to enjoy the sunshine of uh, the Yacht Club Costa Smeralda a little bit later on. Um, let's take a look at the leaderboard and see how things stand at the moment. So, Corky, it's still very tight at the top. Yeah, hugely. So, as uh, Flight 15... Um just had race three come to an end and so this is the leaderboard as it stands after all of the the races have been completed in flight 15 so this is as accurate as it can be in the moment so with your club brigands uh consistency again we've seen in flight 11 both uh Chikadoli, uh, Della, Velabari and uh, Yacht Club Brigens both sort of just uh, throwing in a bit of a, uh, uh, not a great race in those ones. But it was interesting that it was both of those teams in that flight. But uh, obviously one point separating them, not to uh, rule them out. Um, Club de Voile at saint Urban el uh, in four, with 41 points. So still potential snapping distance, a little bit of a slip up in, in flight 13. And so we've got this battle at the top of the table. And of course, anything can happen because of no discard. But really importantly as well is this part of the table because... This is the semi-final. This is what they're all trying to do. Qualify for the final in San Moritz in August. And with that period of time, this is where the boats are going to be battling it out. So we're starting to look around the 14, 15 boat area. And you can instantly see how tight the points are from 12 to 16. 
And I think uh, 14th is the, the cutoff. So if, if you finish in the top 14, you definitely have a slot for the finals in San Moritz at the end of August. Is that correct? That's correct. And exactly looking at those points there, look, one point separating from 12th to 15th. And so a lot of uh, movement still there, but still plenty of opportunity for, for any other team. So two battles going on. One to win this semi-final, but also secondly, more importantly, those top 14 boats qualifying for the final. So two different types of battle going on here. Um, in the race just completed, uh, just before we came on air, um, it was the only all-female crew here from the Royal Danish Yacht Club that actually, I think, managed to win that race according to... Oh, so no, I'm just hearing that maybe they were second in that race. They were leading it and they finished up second in that race. And, and was it Club saint Alban? Uh, El Boeuf that, that won that race. So that's that's a crucial point for them because the French are in third at the moment, but still with a chance of winning overall. Uh, we're on board there with Trina Paludan and the rest of the all-female crew uh, from the Royal Danish Yacht Club. Um, let's just get a sense of how this fits in with the rest of the season of the Sailing Champions League. And we will show you a, a little video now. So, Corky, you and me and Samaritz later on at the end of this summer, that's going to be a fun one to go to and a different type of sailing to, to what we're seeing here. Oh, very different, you know, from the location side of things. But, uh, again, same boat, but you're going to have 14 of the teams taken from here in Porto Cervo. But then also the second semi-final kicking off in uh, St. Petersburg. And, um, and then that's going to bring all of those teams together. So there's going to be some totally different battles, totally different sort of racing. And uh, so it's going to be a, a pretty amazing thing to see who's going to come out on top. Um, so um, if anyone has any questions uh, for us and, and wants any uh, particular comment on any aspect of the racing, what do people do, Corky? Uh, best way, head over to Facebook and uh, go to Sailing CL. You'll be able to get onto the Sailing Champions League site. Um, throw up your comments on there and any questions. It'd be great to see some pictures of uh, where you might be watching this, whether you're watching it from one of the clubs uh, that are being represented here. And it'd be uh, lovely to see your comments. Also, show your support to the sailors. We'll certainly uh, try and do our best to uh, uh, fire out those messages for you. Lovely. So keep those messages coming. Meanwhile, we are just under 1 minute 30 to the start of race one of flight 16. And it, there's a little bit more breeze than what we saw yesterday. Uh, and it looks like beautiful conditions. Um, Corky, from the SAP Sailing Analytics, uh, what is the breeze doing? How much strength and, and uh, what, what sort of angle is it coming from? So we're a little bit further around towards uh, the east as we uh, than we were yesterday. So we might have a little bit of uh, play from the land over towards the east, and that might sort of just create a, a little bit more of a, a shifty race course. We are seeing anything from up to 9 to 11 sort of degrees shifts. As we can see as the drone pans around, you can see some of those islands and parts of the land that are going to possibly impact this uh, the breeze we've got a, a slight port advantage but a reasonably square line and so interesting to see them all 
racking up towards this uh, starboard end. To, to the point where I'm concerned that some of those boats at the top of the picture are not even going to get a look in. They're going to get shut the wrong side of it if they're not careful. Certainly the green sail over right over to the far side looking that that's going to happen. That's a regatta club at Ulvenhofen uh, risking sort of sitting way out of picture and closing that gap and certainly with the time that we've got available. Breeze only about eight and a half knots so slightly lighter so these crews going to have to really dial in very high on the line for boat number eight, which is uh, WSV Heesbeck. So, will it be a clear start? So far, so good. It doesn't sound like there's a second sound signal. And a very good start off the lured end, boat number two. It's one of our front runners for the overall honours here in Portocevo. It's uh, the club, so the Circolo della Villa Bari from Italy. So, very good start for them. But you could argue an even better start for boat number four, Rigata Club. Oberhofen from Switzerland. I, I would say um, they would have won that start. Would you agree, Corky? Well, the interesting thing was we were saying they looked like they were going to get closed out. So in those final sort of 10, 15 seconds, there must have been enough movement on those boats sliding down the line as the bows went down that they came in round from that committee boat end, which we kind of class as a bit of a cowboy start because it could easily have not been that opportunity, but they've come round, come off that side, and they're in control here with a, a port and starboard as they come across from that uh, centre line. What's strange is that um, there seemed to be a, a real commitment towards the committee boat end of the line, and yet you were saying it was an even line. So that implies, from what you were saying in the pre-start, that there might be a land effect or something uh, to drag the boats right. So why, when you get a good start and you have an opportunity to tack early, why do you not take it? I'm, I'm quite surprised that the two boats that got the best starts... Um, uh, actually some of the latest to tack over to the right-hand side. Well, I, I think it's something that we see uh, yesterday. It's a really nice controlling position. What you've got to remember is that these courses are short. You're not really sort of got a lot of distance to sail in either direction. And so they, what they've done is they are just off to the actual centre line of this race course. So they're giving themselves the greatest opportunity for any of the shifts that come in. They came off, they had a clear lane, they had good speed, and they're now starting to track back and cover the other boats. A nice little loose cover as they go back towards the other side, but they're also just keeping an eye on the boats behind. Pretty sure the big yacht just going behind, potentially my song. They've been out uh, a bit of practicing. We saw them hammering around in the background yesterday, but also showed a sheer scale of the size of these boats that are out here on the water compared with the J-70s. And many of these boats now early over towards this right-hand side getting out towards this ley line. And this is the problem because now as these lead boats come back in from the port, the first thing they're going to do is tack over dump straight on top of them and they'll actually give them dirty air for that run in so as a tactical section on the, on a short course coming off that line being able to take that first shift and come up the middle and be able to approach that windward mark slightly from the port hand side but not within that sort of a three boat length circle actually gives them a really commanding position so but the two boats that we see in shot here boats uh regatta club ovenhofen and Circolo de Velabari, they're both in commanding positions as they take this tack up just in front of the group. So it looks like the early lead has gone to Circolo de la Velabari, and that's very useful for them in their bid to win this uh, overall event in Porto Cervo and getting comfortably across the, uh, the bright yellow boat of Royal Danish Yacht Club coming in on port. And the women on the Royal Danish Yacht Club are going to have to be careful as they tack in here. Are they going to be able to do that without fouling some of the boats already on starboard tack? We've seen a few people come a cropper on that. Meanwhile, around the top mark, Kite goes up beautifully on boat number two. It's the Italians who lead at this stage over the Swiss Regatta Club Oberhofen. There, Jenica setting nicely on the light green sails, followed by Royal Danish Yacht Club. Trina Paludan and the women in third place in this race as things stand. And we're on board with uh, Regatta Club Bodensee from Switzerland. Julian Flissati sitting down to Leward at the back of the boat, just uh, sheeting on the main sheet and helping set that kite with... He's in the middle of the traffic. This is the, this is the place where the umpires do their work. We often see penalties handed out in the midsection of the fleet. And bringing up the rear in boat number one, is Hellerup Sail Club from Denmark. So you can see, even though that uh, 
the great thing about this one time racing short course racing is it doesn't actually create too many gaps we are seeing gaps emerge so 24 meters out in sort of front and, and then those gaps sometimes extend up to 40 50 meters for those front running boats but generally in the mid pack they stay very tight and congested and we saw yesterday a lot of people taking some risks getting their penalties and suddenly sliding themselves right to the back of the fleet and you just can't afford to do that in these tight races and so great job coming in here pulling down hard on that clue releasing it out getting that boat up forward the crew sitting nice and far forward you can see many of them up and around that mast area trying to keep the weight forward and get that uh, stern out of the water but there's the lead two boats you can see nice bits of breathing space in between them and the third boat here which is the royal danish yacht club corner league danisk yacht club and it looks at the moment like the leading Italians, uh, oh no, now they've jibed where they have. They could well set themselves up for taking the mark that takes them back out to sea because it, it did seem like going out to sea, going out to the left-hand side of the beat was the way to, to do it. Um, and uh, a good lure drop from the Italians whilst the Swiss sail towards the other mark. And it looks like they have a bit more distance to sail to get to the other mark. So this is playing quite nicely into the hands of the leaders right now. Yeah, too nice. Not bad roundings, a little bit sort of scruffy with the kite sort of coming down and actually losing a lot of actual speed on the way down wind. So the girls holding a bit more momentum all the way around there. So they've done a really nice rounding. Very nice from the all-female team there. And got good momentum out, but close behind them trying to close that gap you can see a lot of them all the angles that they're trying to hold as they go round and really stuff these boats up and it's all becoming a little bit scrappy so jib not unfurled there on boat number six and still trying to get that kite down so it's about still maintaining a good solid teamwork being smooth around the boat keeping the boat speed up certainly in the breeze at the moment it's starting to soften a little bit we've got about six and a half seven knots of breeze so it's starting to go lighter so you can still see some of the team throwing the boat around, being quite aggressive with it in the same sense as if it, there were still the nine, ten knots that were around on the race course. Now this is a really kind of a uh, section for the sailors to go into that mindset, go into that physicality section of we need to smooth and everything out. We need to slow down. We need to keep this momentum going because any sort of maneuvers they're doing where they slow down and lose the speed is going to be costly. Uh, the women on board being lighter, uh, they have five on board instead of most of the other teams, which tend to have four crew. So uh, in some ways, that must give them more opportunity to, uh, to, for weight distribution in, in sort of different configurations compared with the, uh, the four-person crews. Well, it, it does. It's one of those ones where it can either be... Uh, a benefit or it can be a hindrance in that sort of sense is that you know you've got more sets of arms more sets of legs to move around to get the kite down there's more people to either be in the way or be helpful so it depends on how the team's set up they're obviously sailing really nicely they had a good position taking a second in the last race again they're up in the top three again so they're sailing really nicely and smoothly in these conditions and seem to have that fairly well dialed in but um, for some teams they want to run the four person uh, set up I mean, they go for slightly heavier people, but have a little bit more space on that boat. It's interesting that the leaders in boat number two on the left of our picture have tacked underneath the ley line. Often we see the, the crews at the front of the fleet when they have the opportunity to keep the manoeuvres down to a minimum. So I wonder why the Italians have chosen to take two extra tacks. It really does look like it's softening up an awful lot there. And it looks like whatever they saw on the right-hand side of that course, they didn't particularly like the look of. They must think that there's a little bit more breeze up on this left-hand ley line. Right, there's definitely a knock coming in from that right-hand side so a slight header which is causing these boats just to sail on a slightly lower angle but there the, the Royal Danish Yacht Club have made that gain and climbed up into second place and so that little tack up was a good way of keeping some clear breeze in keeping them their bow forward on it so good tactics on board there from the Italian team but a great little gain by the Danes as they come on round, second place on board with them now. Kites hoisted, now settling in. Straight eyes go on to the back of where the next boat is. The Swiss team, Regatta Club Ovenhofen, they're breathing down their neck. Oh, a little cleaner, <laughs> the camera, and there's a nice hand. 
<laughs> but you can see the team all working away, the crew members keeping an eye out. And that's it, because the attacks are all coming in from behind where the boats are. You can see them all tightly packed. Little bit of breathing space, and you can see that in the uh, speed downwind. The Italian team out in front. A slow hoist here from JK Aurora. Oh, no, Ooh. it's going to be a penalty. It looks like it's a penalty on the Slovenians, um, deemed by the umpires, presumably, not to have kept clear uh, from the other boat, WSV Giesbeck from the Netherlands. So an expensive mistake there by the purple boat and almost fouling one of the other boats at the back um, when they are uh, still completing their penalty. So some uh, sloppy sailing there by the Slovenians. And the racetrack now with the breeze staying quite solidly down in line for this nice right side of the course. So that is why everyone's just set and hoisted and just going down this right hand side. So a bit of a procession, not creating much of an opportunity for overtaking as they run down towards the finish line. The speed difference is right there. You can see a little bit further, a little bit quicker out in front, a bit more breathing space and that gap starting to open. So they, they're very comfortable out in front. And no one wanting to go for an early jibe this time. So uh, the breeze that seemed to pay out to sea on the beat, it seems to be what is also convincing the fleet to stay on starboard jibe for as long as possible. So it, it seems like there's a little bit more wind, a little bit more reliable power out to sea on this race course right now. Well, interesting. Since uh, over the last probably eight to nine minutes, so throughout this sort of race as well, we've seen the breeze sitting quite far around to the right at 135, and it's slowly tracked, and over the last eight to 10 minutes, it's gone round to 103, so nearly a 30 degrees wind shift round towards that side. It's really squared up and straightened up this course, but because of that, it's just become that sort of drag race round, and that's exactly why the Italians just taking the win there but did that double tack in and just held themselves out in front right and and it has gone to a very processional race because there's hardly any port jibe remaining on this run uh, the the italians secure that race quite comfortably the danish women representing royal danish yacht club move up to second and steal second place from regatta club oberhof and that for a while looked like they might win that race the swiss have to settle for third against um, another fourth-placed Swiss boat, Regatta Club Bodensee, followed by the Dutch WSV Riesbeek, and then the Danish Hellerup Sail Club and the Slovenians, uh, who took that penalty at the windward mark, bringing up the rear uh, somewhere at the back. But also, oh, Malmo Segel Salskapet. Uh, we haven't had anything to say about them in this race, unfortunately, um, bringing up the rear in that race. Very solid race by Circolo della Velabari, uh, skippered by Simone mm. Ferraresi. And that's exactly what they need to be doing if they're going to continue to take the fight to Yacht Club Brigands, uh, who are their main rivals right now for the overall title here in Portocevo. And still a photo finish, not quite actually, uh, just a, a, a slim win um, to avoid the wooden spoon for J.K. Aurora, boat number seven, coming in just ahead of Malmo Salskapet. This is tricky because, you know, again, we've we talked about this. There's the two battles. There's the obviously the crowning glory of winning one of the semi-finals, but all that does is create that qualification through to the final, and that's where it's all going to be played out. But real battles going on down in the sort of around that 14th position, that cut-off point for people to go through. And uh, the Swedish team that we just said, Malmo, Siegel at Sapple Skapet uh, basically, you know, again, not a wonderful race with a seventh there, really applying some quite big points. And they sit in and around on that borderline of those uh, those figures. Still with uh, two more races to run in this flight, it's going to bump them out of that sort of qualification place at the moment. So they're right on that borderline and they need to find some kind of consistency and a few better races to try and scrape them back up. And Malmo, uh, just to give you some context, I mean, they might have finished at the back in that race, but they've got a couple of second places in, in some of the other races. So they're quite capable of finishing at the top end of these races, as indeed most of the teams are that we see. The 22 teams out here, nearly all of them have the potential to win races at some point across the four days of competition. 
but it's all about the consistency. And at the moment, Malmo need to find some more consistency at, consistency at the front end of these races if they're going to secure one of these top 14 places. And we're on board here with APCC Nantes from France, skipped by Simon Beto. I wonder, um, whilst all the boats are identical, I, I wonder how many little tweaks each of the teams have when they step on board a boat. Um, do they bring their own bits and pieces, their own little bits of elastic and, and rope and things like that? Um, do they tape things up differently to, to other teams? Can they retune the rigs? Do you... I, th I think with regard to the rig, I don't think there's a, a huge amount you'll do to it. There'll be a, a pretty standardized sort of what's going on and what you can actually get away with doing. Um, but they'll certainly have a few things that you'll be able to do really quickly on the water that they'll uh, make those adjustments. But um, again, we see that was the Yacht Club, the Monaco, jumping straight on board there and now straight into their race. So they uh, haven't got a lot of time. They need to just see what the wind's done. Obviously, in that last race, we've seen there's been up to about a 30 degrees wind shift. That's, you know, pretty radical in that side of things. So now for these sailors that have been sat watching that race, now need to get out, see what it feels like, and, uh, and reset themselves. Um, now, because of the success of the Sailing Champions League concept and the national leagues that have only been around for five years but have made a big impact on um, the kind of sailing that we see taking off around Europe, um, there's been a couple of developments this season, some, some brand new um, sub-leagues, and one of those is a, is a youth league. Another one is the Women's Sailing League. Let's hear from one of the women that are looking forward to competing in that new league. Hi, I'm Josvin from KDY. Well, the real difference between men and women in sailing is actually that men are way more hysterical. They yell more. They always feel mistreated. It's everyone else's fault, never their own. So that's actually that's the main difference. They're actually the ones being the hysterical ones out there. Great. So uh, you heard of... Very offensive. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you heard about the Women's Sailing Champions League. Um, what are your, your thoughts about it? How do you like it? So it's really great that it's going to be an uh, all-female event in Kiel. Uh, I think it's, it's a really good opportunity to get more young, especially young women, to, to get together and sail and actually show them that it's possible to, to do racing on a high level. So I think it's, it's a good way to get more women to start and then at the end I think they should compete against the guys because we actually beat them. Wow, <laughs> that's really interesting. So, but in general, how do you like the Sailing Champions League as a sailor? Well, actually I'm, the Sailing Champions League is really great because it's really easy. You don't have to have your own boat, your own gear, you can just bring your bag and take a flight ticket. And then, so everyone, it's really, really easy to, to just go out sail. It's fun, it's fast, it's short, so it's, it's perfect for sailing. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hysterical? How dare Josephine call me hysterical? I've never been hysterical in my life. Not your characteristics whatsoever. No, how, how dare she? Um, anyway, um, we, you've heard it here first from Josephine just then, men are more hysterical and women are not. Um, so that's, that's why perhaps they're doing as well as they are in the competition here in Porto Cervo, because they're keeping it cool, they're keeping it calm, they're not shouting at each other, there's no blame game on board their boat. You can't afford the blame game, can you, in this kind of racing? No, well, if, if we, you know, it looks uh, like they haven't done many races when you say, oh, it's flight 16, but actually flight 16... Race two, which is what we're going in on, is race 47. Okay, they haven't raced all 47 races, but uh, for them to keep mentally strong, to keep focused, you're jumping in the boat, you might do one race and then you might not sail for three races, or it could be four, it could be, you know, so you can be actually out the boat for quite a long time, then you have to get back into it. And when there's that chopping and changing, similar to sort of the match racing bit, it can become quite hard because you can get distracted, you can switch off, and it's then trying to bring yourself back into the here and now, what's going on with the information, what's going on with the win. And, but then again, you can spend your whole time analysing, focusing this and not switching off. So it can become a, a very mentally draining bit. But so staying cool, staying calm, collected, having a good team uh, around you that all do the same. And um, it certainly looks like they've got a, a fairly solid team with them. Just one minute to go, and I'm wondering, based on the, what we saw in the last race, when we saw that big 
left-hand wind shift uh, that was, was really cr uh, critical on the final beat of that race. What would the tactics be now? Would you expect that wind direction to hold or would you expect it to, to go back to the right? In other words, which end of the line do you want? Well, at the moment, there's uh, quite a big pin end bias up to about sort of uh, 14 meters advantage. So it's a significant sort of uh, advantage up there. So um, you'll see no one really attacks the port end as a sense. They'll all sit. So there we go. You can see them wanting to be down towards this port end, but they'll be right up underneath their uh, the windward boat trying to hold off that position so here we are with uh, yacht club de monaco looking in a comfortable position down towards this pin and they're in control look a long way off from this line and pulled the trigger late on this line but you can see them struggling to get actually over this line I wonder if there's been another wind shift or something because really um, the, the boats at the pin end were a little bit late onto that and Yacht Club Monaco only just squeezing around that mark and uh, really a fairly poor start by Yacht Club Monaco. Then again, as you can see from this shot now, uh, shot now they, they're still in a good controlling position on APCC Nantes just on their windward hip. Um, the question now for them is, can they tack as early as they want to? Because if Nantes can sit there and live there, yeah, you see, you can see um, Francois uh, is, Brenac is telling them to go. He's telling Nantes how to sail their race. <laughs> but Nantes is lifting out on their hip, and um, actually it looks like Yacht Club Monaco is... Oh, no, they're coming back. They're coming back. There's, so there's a bit of a match race going on here between the French and the Monegasque. And, and actually, as Corky has just pointed out to me, maybe what uh, Francois Brenac was pointing to was the, uh, the power boat wash. And maybe he feels he's been fouled by one of the boats out on the water, one of the ribs. Well, it just, when we look back at that start, it just seemed like a poor start for a, a number of the boats there because the breeze is still sitting, if not starting to track slightly back towards the right-hand side. So it was just where they had all lined up and positioned themselves. But yeah, you can see the swell coming through on the, on some power boat that's either come through or movement. And you can see that very clearly from the drone shots here. And well, in these boats, well, that's something significant. We've got the breeze there at sort of six and a half, seven knots. And that could be quite nice to, to have a bit of that underneath you, couldn't you? I mean, well, if to, you to take the advantage, be up wind potentially. Yeah, take the advantage and actually go with it and not punch through it. But, you know, it was interesting, quite a lot of punch through it and stuff. Certainly Yacht Club Monaco came through this side of it and now they're chasing it back down. But if they get onto that, that's certainly going to make a gain there. So you can see how uh, noticeable the whole swell lines from that are and how they're lifting up and the big significant pushes as they we zoom in on uh, boat number one there which is APC C Nance and uh, you can see them just being picked up by that swell and pushed that's given nice advantage but this breeze clocking slightly round towards the right we've just seen a big shift round towards the right for about 10 15 degrees and now it's starting to track back to the left so they, there was a short advantage a little bit gained from those right boats, but now the boats sitting out on that right are going to start to lose again as this breeze is going left hard. So it's going to come back and start to uh, favour again Yacht Club de Monaco. They just look a little bit more powered up to me. I didn't think they looked very good 20 seconds ago, but they just, they've just still got their legs out. They're hiking hard, and the boats that have tacked onto starboard, they look a little bit soft on that side of yeah. the course. So a little bit of a repeat of what we saw in the previous race, which played into the hands of the Italians. Um, so now it's, it, it's uh, squeaky bottom time for the, uh, the Yacht Club de Monaco. Will they have enough speed to get across the front of the starboard tackers? Well, this is it. They've got nice breeze. Breeze coming up, up to over eight knots. Comfortably coming in from that left-hand side. All looks good. Should clear in front. Going for attack just to, to cover that position. Tight on that lay, but they're nice and comfortably in here. But squeezing that mark and shooting it again. So very interesting, sort of just, again, from that start, going back to that, there was a lot of people pushing that start really hard. But were actually in the wrong positions and they saw them actually having to squeeze around that mark where they could have comfortably gone round. But uh, all looking very comfortable at front. Yacht Club Monaco lead. Yacht Club Brigens right there. They're the ones battling it out as well at the top of this leaderboard. And so every consistency is going to matter. And the boat going round now with the dark blue sail number one is APCC Nantes. And if you remember at the start, they had a pretty much identical start to Yacht Club de Monaco. But how things can change 
in the course of, of that one beat. They find themselves back in fifth place and with some gap to the top four. So a uh, very different set of fortunes for the two boats that started next to each other. Yacht Club de Monaco in the lead and APCC Nantes in fifth. But Monaco have to look over their shoulder at Yacht Club Brigands. Yacht Club Brigands, one of the front runners for winning this regatta, uh, one of the overall leaders and very consistent performance, uh, performers are the Austrians. So Yacht Club Monaco know that they've got a form team breathing down their neck. And we're on board with Monaco, just managing to stay on a slightly lower line than Yacht Club Brigands, which is very critical for Francois Brenac and his crew because it means that they can choose to jibe whenever they want to. So that's a, a good defending position uh, for the pink sail on the right-hand side. Now the question is, um, how much has the breeze shifted? How much of this is turning into a one-way track in the way that we saw on the final run down to the finish of the previous race? And no one's jived off yet, which suggests that with that uh, change in breeze that we saw just now, that this is a bit of a one-way track. It's exactly that. That breeze is moving round towards that left again. We're at about 109 degrees. So uh, that little spike over towards that right, back round to 126. And that was where that little advantage came. But then it very quickly went back towards that left-hand side and again has stayed in this left phase, causing a lot of boats come down here. Only one boat separating out towards the far right-hand side. But Yacht Club Brigands having a shocker. And Yacht Club Brigands being rolled by a number of boats here. A, a really poor jibe. And um, it looks like they may have given up at least one, if not two places. It, it just depends on how the, uh, the bright green spinnaker, which seems to be carrying on to the other mark. Yes, they're carrying on to the other mark, sailing extra distance. Uh, but a, a real error by Yacht Club Brigands dropping from second to, to fourth place and having to do a 180 handbrake turn to get around that mark. Be really interesting to see how the boat that goes out to the far side of the course uh, fares from doing that. I think that's uh, Orlanska, uh, Orlanska from uh, Finland that's gone out round the opposite way. But we're back looking at Yacht Club de Monaco, Francois Brenac just calling for an early tack. So they haven't sailed very far out to the left. Nice roll tack up to the new side, keeping the boat speed on and the Monagas crew maintaining control and uh, really increasing their dominance on this race, partly because of the error made by Yacht Club Brigands with that awful jibe that they did just now. Well, they just, it, it seemed uh, an opposition. They obviously went into a slightly attacking mode. They couldn't soak deep, so Yacht Club Monaco held that deeper line on the kite, so they went slightly higher, a little bit quicker, started to get a bit of a roll going, and that's when they and Yacht Club Monaco jibed off. They tried to hold that little bit of speed and go a bit deeper and looking for a tighter line into that gate, but sailed a much greater distance, a poor jibe, and it just enabled the two, three boats to roll straight down with speed above it bit of a schoolboy error in that sense i would say so yeah yeah and and you can see the wimble mark on the left hand side of the picture it looks like yacht club monaco is in good breeze and with a good angle and uh, i wonder if um orlanska um at the top of picture boat number three has not done so well by going around the opposite mark on the other hand yacht club regens is at the bottom of our screen boat number four ycb and uh the most furthest left boat right now but uh, still back in fourth place and only just crossing APCC Nantes so uh, a real giveaway by Yacht Club Brigands and it's moments like these where um, this championship could be decided it, it won't necessarily be on the final race of the day where this championship is decided it's small errors like that that can compound on themselves and and not potentially not the Austrians back down the leaderboard that's exactly what we're really seeing at the moment. If they uh, had stayed there consistent one-two sort of way, then uh, they would have a little bit of breathing space at the top of the table. But in their current position at the moment, this will hold them back into third, sort of battling for second and third. So, uh, yeah, very tight at the moment. 
having said this about Yacht Club Brigands, uh, boat number seven in the middle of our picture, going left as they have done has served them pretty well. And the, and the boat that went round um, the far mark and went up the right-hand side of this beat, the Finnish team, have really not done very well at all. So Yacht Club Brigands have got themselves out of jail to some extent by keeping faith with the left-hand side of the course further out to sea. It is a bit of a one-way track at the moment. It's not to say that there aren't opportunities going the other way, but it seems more risky to go inshore right now. Well, definitely, as to say, when we looked at and had that drone shot looking up the course, you could see those islands and could see a little bit more of a, a shoreline that's going to affect this breeze. What we're seeing with the breeze is it is bouncing around from anything up to about 126, 127 degrees round towards the right, but then tracking all the way back to 107 degrees round to the left-hand side. But over the last sort of 10, 15 minutes, that breeze is staying more in that left phase. We haven't seen it go as far around to the right as we have done with that little spike. And so people are kind of taking that hit out towards the right, trying to gain that advantage, but the advantage is so short. And it certainly looks like there's lighter breeze over there with the breeze only at eight and a, eight and a half knots at the moment. But it looks like you get the full eight, eight and a half knots on this left-hand side. Over towards that right, just looks that little bit soft all the time. And so you've got to either have a bold strategy to be going out towards that right, or you're just trying to clear your air and keep your fingers crossed a little bit. Well, bold strategy it would be right now. It doesn't seem that anyone who's going out to the right is getting rewarded for doing so. And Yacht Club Monaco, they were the pin and boat at the start of this race. They've probably consistently been the more left-hand boat of nearly any boat in the fleet in terms of where they've positioned themselves on the two windward legs. And they've been rewarded with quite a healthy lead at the moment over Wassersport Verein Hemmerlingen from Germany, who are in second place in that light blue spinnaker in the middle of our picture right now with Yacht, Yacht Club Bregenz back up to third. So a little bit of a get out of jail for Yacht Club Bregenz by taking the left-hand side of that last beat. Well, again, it's just very interesting because the course is just staying on this one side track. You can see everyone just uh, processioning down, bar one boat just separating off, which is the RS-280. The Lithuanian team sort of spreading out towards that uh, side, just trying to create some bit of a breakaway and an opportunity for overtaking because at the moment it is very processional. But it does show that it all comes down to speed. It all comes down to boat handling. And these guys, happy as they cross the line, as they squeezed around that pin end off that start and then held on to that left-hand side. That was what confirmed them in that position. They've managed to hold on and take the race win. And very successful race there for Monaco, who, to be honest, I thought they would be doing more of that in this regatta, even though they're brand new to this form of sailing. They've never competed in the Sailing Champions League before, uh, but we've got some former Olympic representatives in the 49er class sailing on board that boat. So we've got some of the highest quality sailors of any of the crews here. Um, but uh, the Monaco team have had problems with starting too early in a number of the races. They're counting a lot of letters in their score rather than actual finishing positions. Um, and that finds them still in the battle for qualifying for the finals in San Moritz, but that first place in that race will have done them a power of um, good and hopefully we'll be getting the Monaco crew somewhere up close to the top 10 overall. The Yacht Club Brigands, they had a sniff of being able to win that race. Um, and then they made that error with that jive towards the bottom of the first run, uh, which really put them out of contention for winning the race, but at least managed to sneak back to third. We're on board at the moment with Cape Crow Yacht Club, just getting the boat ready, getting the Swedish flag on the back. And it's a young crew um, that represents Cape Crow Yacht Club, skippered by Jakob Lundqvist. And they also are one of these teams um, that are on the cusp of qualifying. Uh, they are in the mid-teens right now, and they have a lot of work to do today if they're going to secure one of those spots for Sam Moritz at the end of August for the finals of the Sailing Champions League. So we're in the changeover mode right now, and um, a few new crew stepping on board for what will be, uh, well, race three of Flight 16, race 48 overall of this competition.
Well, and uh, with still one more race to finalise this flight, this will obviously change the leaderboard, but the uh, top three boats all on equal points with 40 points at the moment. So there is still the French team, Club de Voile, saint Alban, Uldeboeuf uh, to race. So even with uh, if they take a race win, that will put them one point behind. But uh, Yacht Club Brigens and uh, Circolo del Velabari are up on front on equal points. So a three-horse race at the moment, but with an outside chance for the fourth-place boat of Segel und Motorboat Club Uberlingen to also come into the podium if they have a good day. And then a bit of a, a drop away on the points after that for Regatta Club Bordensee and Yacht Club Monaco actually up to uh, sixth place. So they're, they're actually doing a lot better than I had given them credit for. They, they've had a good climb um, in recent races with a second in their previous race earlier this morning. Nice shot of uh, all the sailors. We're just on the boat Matilda, which is where they uh, camp out in between the races. Bar obviously on the ribs. Here we're with the umpires now. And I hear that we have an opportunity for an interview with one of the sailors, and I believe it's uh, with the Austrian team Yacht Club Bregenz. So I hope we can have an on-the-water interview with one of the leading lights in this competition coming up. So I'm just going to see, can, can I be heard out on the water? Am I speaking to Yacht Club Regans? Yeah. Okay, so who, who yeah, am I? Yeah, Yacht Club Regans. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now and I can see you. Hi, this is Andy Rice for the com uh, commentary team. Um, who am I speaking to? And your name is? Uh, it's uh, Jodok King from the Yacht Club Regans. Okay, well, uh, the bowman of the yacht club, Bregenz, Jodok Kung, is here. Thanks, for, thanks for joining us. And um, so, how's it going for you? Um, that was a that was a difficult race for you, but you managed to salvage a third place in that one, Jodok. Yeah, it's well, it's always difficult. I have to say. And we learned that like third places are still pretty good out here because it's so tight. The competition is so tight. The other sailors are so good as well. So we learned quite uh, fast that second or third places might uh, also save you the day. So we just try to keep it constant. Um, so uh, coming towards the bottom of that run, first time down, you were lying in second, just breathing down the neck of Yacht Club Monaco. And um, then something went wrong with the jibe and suddenly things looked like they were uh, falling apart for you. What, what happened there? Well, that was exactly my, my mistake there. I stepped on, the, uh, on one of the lines so we couldn't jibe properly. And I was on the other hand working so I didn't notice that I stepped on the line. But yeah, we, we managed it and... We lost this one place, which was, of course, unfortunate. But we recovered, and yeah, then, then we got the third place, which is still all right for us here. So I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot there, Jodok. I didn't realize it was um, your mistake on the boat. Well, thanks for owning up to that. Is that why everyone else is sitting at the <laughs> no opposite? No problem there, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered if that's why everyone else was sitting at the opposite end of the rift from you. <laughs> no, it's just... No, I'm just joshing you. It's all <laughs> no, right. it's not that bad, actually. I mean, we, we know that we're one team, so. And, uh, and no, I, I don't. No, that, that's all fine with us. We're having a good spirit, and that's all good. Well, Yodok, well, thank you very much for joining us and, and taking out the time. And uh, you guys are sailing incredibly well. We wish you the best for the rest of today, and uh, we'll see how things play out at the end of this afternoon. Very best of luck to you. Well, thank you very much as well, and uh, all thanks to the sailing community out there watching us. Have a great day, and see you around. So that was Jorok Kung from Yacht Club Bregenz owning up to that mistake in that race, but saying that they are still one team, and uh, a third place is very much one that you'd still want to count in, in this kind of competition that rewards consistency. Um, so we are going to come in back in to uh, the next race soon, but uh, we're on board with the good ship Matilda, so uh, if they can hear us on the good ship Matilda, it'll be lovely to get away from you. And um, We have about four minutes to the start of the next race, 
Um, and uh, so, oh yeah, we're getting a, <laughs> we're getting some kind of reaction <laughs> from the good ship, Matilda. This is where the uh, the sailors hang out. Um, Corky, what's what's the breeze doing right now? So at the moment we've got uh, the breeze still sitting around the eight knot sort of. Uh, area we've also got the breeze still sitting round towards uh, the left but actually what we've noticed at the beginning part of this uh, section that breeze spiking round towards that right hand side a little bit again so actually it's staying in the right phase a bit so be prepared to see this breeze move round towards that left hand side as this race goes on and I think we'll see teams starting to protect that uh, left hand side again if anyone commits towards the right it's a very, very brave move. They might make an early gain, but actually over the period of time, they'll probably lose out a bit. Line's looking pretty square again with the breeze moving back towards this right. But as we feel, and as we've seen over the last race, that breeze starting to track towards that left-hand phase. And if that happens, it will create that little bit of bias towards that port end. And even if we see it move right round towards that left-hand side, a huge bias towards that left side. So it depends on where people are going to position, but a fairly... Uh, Simple racetrack in the terms of being able to get off, keeping an eye on that left-hand side. Short gains made on that right, but you're not able to capitalise them into long-term gains. Bearing in mind the last race was won by the boat that won the pin end of the line, the Yacht Club Monaco, who didn't actually even get a particularly fast start off the pin end. They had to sort of squeeze round the mark to get round it, but they still won the race from there. Would you not expect to see a little bit more of a battle for the left-hand side of this start? Um, I'd like to see more people just fighting for that side. We've been really quite surprised by how many people haven't really gone near it, um, to be honest. And certainly with uh, the breeze being in this left phase, being out towards that left-hand side is a favourable thing. The problem is, is that if you don't get a wonderful start and you do sit on that left-hand side, exactly how we did see for Yacht Club Monaco in that sense, they were being held there and they weren't able to tack out until other competitors tack out. So in a way, they were out of control on their start in that sense because someone else is controlling when they were able to tack. So pretty tricky for any boat um, deciding to wedge themselves down to that left side. You need to be able to take that opportunity to tack on that first shift. Less than one minute to go now, and we're on board with Vaughan Lendersher Yacht Club from Austria, skippered by Rene Mangold, very experienced uh, racing skipper. And still a lot of manoeuvring and um, not much pattern yet uh, with only 38 seconds to go to the start. Now there's a pattern forming. Everyone is pretty much head to win, just edging their way on to starboard tack. Um, and again, not very much sign of anyone desperately wanting the pin end. They're mostly fighting for the committee boat end. And um, well, boat number seven looks like it's going to make a bit of a bid. Um, for this end of the line. Long um, way back from everybody. And as they sort of surprised by, you know, there is definitely that bid for that pin end, but people misjudging it all over the place. You look at how line is skewed now at the moment with three minutes to go, uh, three seconds to go. Ooh, and very, very close for boat number seven. And it looks like they're going to be over. And that's one of the leading lights in this competition. Club de Voile, Santo Ban El Boeuf have to go back round and restart, leaving the way clear for Cape Crow Yacht Club. Boat number five just going out of picture. So some very messy starts there by three boats. And, and some of those teams, we would expect better of them, not least from Santo Ban, who are now going out to the what we think is the less favoured right-hand side. So the boats that are going in that direction are only go, going there because they're making amends for a poor start. So I would say best start on this occasion goes to Cape Crow Yacht Club, who we're on board with now. And uh, Jakob uh, Lundquist looking quite relaxed there on the tiller of the boat and in position to tack pretty much whenever he wants. And I wouldn't be surprised if he tacks fairly soon. But again, very interesting. It's like they're sort of unsure where the line is again and the misjudgment of that port uh, port pin end is, uh, as I say, they, they were in a great position at about 10 to 12 seconds to go. Put the bow down a little bit early, got a bit too much pace, then tried to put it back down again and then ended up the only opportunity to shoot the mark. And as they shot over it, it was too early and they misjudged the time. So... I think they were a little bit spooked by boat number two, the Italians from Cecciatel Canottieri Gardasello, who looked like they were going to start uh, pushing on the French. But actually, in the end, the Italians couldn't even make the pin end. And I think they had to jibe round. 
So uh, a, a big um, unforced error by the team from Garda as well. But it's all played nicely into the hands on the boat um, left of our picture, which is the young Swedes representing Cape Crow Yacht Club, who need a race win to make sure that they lift themselves out of that relegation zone and, and make sure that they're on the right side of the cutoff for the top 14 who will go through to the finals in San Moritz later on this summer. Well, that's exactly how you asked me, sort of what, what people's plans were going to be. And the breeze was sitting around sort of 120, 118. So it was still in that right phase at about a minute to go, but had to guard that left-hand side. It was obviously going to move back towards that left-hand side. It was never going to stay in that right phase. And as they, as we came towards the start, that breeze going all the way back and dialing back to 111 degrees giving that advantage, making it tricky to get over that line, but playing out for that uh, left-hand side. And that's exactly what the Swedish team did there. Cape Crow Yacht Club came off that line, got a great start, held in, got that first shift out onto that left-hand side, and the advantage has played to them with the breeze now up to about nine knots again. And we're seeing that breeze staying in on this left-hand side better. Still looks a little bit soft on that right side again. It certainly does. And so that's a nice, solid defensive position for Cape Crow Yacht Club in the uh, the purple sailed boat on the left of picture. The closest to them is the dark blue just to their right, which is Borgenländische from Germany. Uh, but one of those boats that was forced to go around and, and restart is the, the bright yellow sail on, on the right-hand side of picture, who I thought was doing well, but actually now that... We see the Starb attackers. They've, they've got a bit of a struggle on. So the Cape Crow Yacht Club going around with an extremely good lead by the standards of this short course racing. There, Jenica up and setting before anybody else has even rounded the mark. And uh, the Germans on Borgen Landisher have to take the long way round to give Societa Canottieri space to go around. And a very good hoist by the Italians on boat number two. Um, their mainsail not looking very healthy, though, and they're going to get rolled over the top by Borg and Landisher, who are going to retake second place, it looks to me. And who do we see going round at the back of the fleet? It is boat number seven. Is the... And is the French who made such a mess of that pin and start. Club de Voile, Santo Ban El Boeuf. So, so before going into this race... It was a three-way uh, tie at the top on 40 points. Currently, obviously, with this seven, it will keep them in third, but it drops them seven points away from first and second, wow. which is a huge amount into these final flights. So, again, that one start, that one sort of pushing it too hard and then having to go out towards that unfavored right-hand side, trying to come back up that middle part of the course, this could, one, this one flight could see them Obviously, with, uh, obviously, it's reliant on the other boats and the other teams to how they get on. But if they keep their consistency, be the end of their uh, title shot here in, in uh, Porto Gevo. Well, they certainly have a lot to do if they're going to salvage anything from this race right now. But Cape Crow Yacht Club, um, we just had that view of the fleet way back behind them. We say way back. We're only talking 50 metres, but 50 metres might as well be... Um, 50 kilometers in this kind of racing. That's a very healthy lead that the young Swedes have right now as they complete their second jibe and get that Jenica away for a, a nice relaxed drop and sailing out to the left-hand side of the course, which served them so well on the first beat. So they're going exactly where they want to go and uh, the rich are getting richer. Well, it's exactly that. You can see how tightly packed these little groups are forming behind them. They don't have to consider anyone except where they want to sail. And then as once the uh, rest of the team start to make their way around the gate, they can just uh, shadow cover them back. But we can see that lead over 60 meters. It's, you know, it couldn't be any more comfortable for them exactly where they would want to be. But a battle firmly on here. And again, the two of the boats that we're really keeping an eye on are the back markers, which is Club de Voile, saint Alban Ulbeuf, uh, who are currently in that back sort of boat, but also the uh, Siegel and Mutterboot Club at Überlinge. They are uh, just uh, the boat just in front of them, but those are the guys fighting for third and fourth. So actually, if the German pairing were able to squeeze up a little bit and make a couple more places in this race, then they could really apply. So very tight and scrappy roundings, and this is where a gain's going to be made. 
And that gain, if anyone has made gains around that lure mark and those scrappy roundings, it's Club de Saint Elbeuf, El the, the team that need to get back these vital points if they're going to have a chance of winning overall in Porto Cervo. They made a, a great rounding whilst the purple boat on our right of picture is forced to take a penalty, and that's Uberlingen. So Uberlingen now right at the back. Um, meanwhile, Cape Crow in the middle of our screen absolutely running away with this race. A 65-metre uh, lead over Moss Salforening from Norway, the yellow boat on the right of picture. The two boats that surprised me are the ones at the top of screen. They didn't have to go around that mark, but they chose to go around there. Borgen Lendischer and Societa Canottieri Garasalo. So the Italians and the Germans choosing to go out to the right-hand side. And surely, if they were doing their homework while they were sitting on the good ship Matilda, they would have seen that history so far this afternoon does not reward those on the right-hand side of this race course. Well, again, it's, it's, it's like there's a sort of a, a one-track mind on the tactics in the sense of, fine, take the other gate mark. Get yourself away from all the other sort of disturbance, the other boats, clear your air but come back across, use that gate mark just to give you that bit of breathing space and then come back and protect that left-hand side. Just because you take that other gate mark doesn't mean you now need to commit far to that right-hand side. And it just does seem a bit of a, an odd tactic. They're going out, they've obviously got nice clear air, they're near anyone else, but the advantage generally coming from this left-hand side. So it's, it just seems like a bit of a, a bold strategy. It's a way of clearing out, getting away from anybody else. So I appreciate what they're trying to do in that sort of sense. But they're going to find that these boats coming in from that left-hand side are going to have the advantage as they come into the mark. Cape Crow Yacht Club going around the Wimbledon mark for the final time, and there's no one that can threaten them. I would say that of all the races that we've watched over the last couple of days, this has to be the most emphatic lead that we've seen so far. The Norwegians in second place just going past under their boom um, and still to uh, tack on to starboard tack. We're about to see the yellow boat do that. But look what the gap is now. Back to Co Cape Crow Yacht Club, drifting down towards the finish, well in the lead. The Norwegians making a nice safe tack around the Wimber mark. And coming up now, Borgen Lendischer in third place in boat number one. And in fourth place, Club de Foile Santoban El Berf. So that's a good climb from the back of the race to come in the middle position now in, in fourth. Can they make any more gains? They're salvaging something out of this race, are the French. And that's what they needed to do if they are to stay in contention with Bari and Bregenz from Italy and Austria in the overall battle for honours here in Porto Cervo. The kite only just said that it came out uh, as a bit of a wine glass, so has that twist in the middle, and it uh, took some effort for them to get that. So certainly uh, not going to uh, allow that gap to close, but look at the distance out in front. That's all Cape Crow Yacht Club will be trying to do, see if they can get over the 100-metre barrier, see if they can uh, be first team through to claim such a lead and there we see it in that uh, right hand side alongside the other boat names it's very close that they've just extended out and a, a great race that all came from a not a you know wasn't an amazing start but it came off in control of that left side two boats that were really fighting for that left hand side not making it one being over the line having to go back cleared them out they favoured that middle to left side. And again, with that breeze over towards that, we see it starting to track right again. So there's a little bit more of an oscillation sort of pattern happening with the breeze. But still, if you're not keeping an eye on that mid to left side, that's it. It's game over. It does seem that way. It was a lot more even yesterday, I would say. I think today is much more about winning the left and protecting the left-hand side of this race course. So... That's some justified high fives on board the Swedish crew, Cape Crow Yacht Club, who win race three of flight 16 by almost 100 metres. And the rest of the teams still to come down. Moss Salforening uh, hoping to hold on to second place. And they look like they're pretty in a pretty healthy position to do that, just in the back of our picture. Here's the bright yellow kite, the Jenica blowing through as the Norwegians secure second place, skippered by Karl Einar Jensen and 
quite a comfortable victory for them. Now it's getting a little bit tighter, but Borgen Lendershire Yacht Club look like they're going to hold on for third. And then coming in for fourth, Club de Voile, Saint-Aubin, El Boeuf, salvaging that fourth place from what looked like a disastrous start to the race. And um, a bit of a giveaway there in fifth place, the Red Boat um, from Italy, who really shouldn't have taken the right-hand side of that race course. And then at the back is the purple boat from Überlingen, who had to take that penalty at the bottom of the first run. And uh, so that really put them on the back foot. And it was um, a penalty that they never recovered from that you can see now. No, well, they were neck and neck battling it out with uh, Club de Voile, Santulban, and El Boeuf. And, uh, but because of that sort of poor situation, the kite not coming down, having a real struggle with that and that penalty at that bottom, slid them to the back and now has pushed them from where they were sat sort of in fourth with uh, on fairly unequal points have slipped to fifth and so that's been uh, pretty tight but Cape Crow Yacht Club with that win bump up to 12th and as you say sort of uh, just uh, in a couple of places secure of that qualification place and so something they're really really focused on doing well let, let's bring up that leaderboard Corky and, and let's take a look at it on screen and, and just get a sense of how things are shaping up so this was the battle, as we see, uh, Club de Voile, saint Alban, El Berth with uh, in that final flight, scoring a fourth. So obviously was much uh, worse than that. But the boat that was uh, really inflicting um, the pain and had been was the German team with uh, Überlinger, sat and now slipped into fifth. They're down with uh, 53 points. So actually a chance where they had to capitalise on the mistake from the French of being over on that line. Um, wasn't enough, but uh, let's just track, uh, track down to the second part of the leaderboard and uh, see where Cape Crow Yacht Club after that first. So that sees them, as we can see, up into 12th. So that race win took them from battling it out fiercely still for that 14th, those top 14 spots. And, uh, has they're given hardly them comfortable a bit of a still, are they? I mean, um, they're only three points above the drop zone, so... Um, you know, they're, 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 that's certainly what they needed to do. And if they can get another um, top three in, in the next couple of races, then they're, they're home and dry. But uh, that win for them, for the Swedes, was really critical in, in lifting them out of the relegation zone. Um, but they're, but, but they're not, by no means safe quite yet. No, it is all still to play for in these up and coming races and it but it just shows how tight it is is that you just cannot afford to have those mistakes creep in and it, that was that third place for Borgen Landershire yacht club from germany that that was their best score in some races when you look along their line of results they've got an awful lot of sixes and sevens in recent races so that's a good morale booster from them but they've still got work to do because They've got five points off the 14th place boat, Jacques Club Scheveningen from the, ne the Netherlands, who are the boats at the moment who are just above the cutoff point. And uh, oh, we've just had it pointed out, and excuse me for the, for the mistake, I've been referring to the... Uh, Borgenlander Schuyer Club as German. I should, in fact, say they're Austrian, so excuse me on that. And a lot of support for the team that we're on board with here. The Finnish team, we see uh, numerous comments on Facebook, so again, it's a great opportunity to show your support for the teams right where you're uh, watching this from, if there's any comments for the teams, any questions you've got uh, to us in the commentary side of things as well. Um, but uh, chuck up your pictures of where you're watching it from. We would love to see that. So head to uh, Facebook forward slash Sailing CL. So here we are. We're looking at some of the comments and, uh, and on that screen. It would be lovely to see your comments and towards the team. So uh, keep us updated as much as we are through the commentary. So we're back on board with the Finnish team. Olanska Segal Salska Pet. Skippered by Daniel Matson, And this is a team that's done very well in the past in the Sailing Champions League. So, um, 
For those of us who are new to the sport, and, and actually those of us that are even quite familiar with it, we've got a nice little explainer from Marcus Bauer. Um, it's part of our Crash Course Sailing series, and uh, this one is really to explain why boats don't just sail from A to B. Why do they do those silly zigzags? To understand an Olympic racetrack, you have to understand one basic fact about sailing. Boats can sail any direction apart from straight into the wind and about 45 degrees left and right of that. Boats need to use their momentum to tack through this sector and zigzag up against the wind. So why is it that all Olympic classes start straight against the wind? Wouldn't it be easier if boats would simply sail from A to B in a right angle to the wind without all that zigzagging? Yes, it would, but it would also leave out a lot of the strategy and tactics that make sailing so interesting. That is because sailboats like race cars and cyclists trail a wind shadow behind them. But unlike cyclists, sailors try to avoid that wind shadow like the plague because it slows them down. If boats just race from A to B in a straight line, whoever won the start... So sailors decided that's boring. Let's instead start straight into the wind opening the door for the intricate strategies and tactics that are often described as chess on water. Sailors are always trying to predict which is the better side of the course, which has more wind, less waves, and above all, favorable wind shifts. That's one of the cool things about sailing. Sailors can actually shorten their track by taking advantage of wind shifts. So being fitter will help you sail faster, but being smarter will help you to sail a shorter distance. Thank you, Marcus Bauer, and I really enjoy those crash course sailing series because um, it reminds me of how much we know Corky. We didn't think we knew anything, but we're actually, no, he explains it beautifully. Um, it's a complicated sport to get across, um, but uh, things like that, I think, really help us get a grip on, um, on how this complex sport does work. So we're waiting for the start of race one. This is the, the beginning of... Flight 17, the penultimate flight here in Portocevo, hosted by Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. And a pattern has emerged, and both in terms of the, the leaderboard and also what's going on with the breeze. Um, it does seem like there's a pattern that the sailors should be paying attention to, Corky. Well, we're just starting to see the breeze is still wanting to try and flick right now and again, but it's in such short bursts of it that taking advantage of that over across... Uh, the whole course, it's just not giving you that long-term advantage. So this uh, mid to left-hand side has to be protected, and that's where we're seeing these lead boats come from. Coming off towards the pin end, mid to pin end, and then taking that first shift, coming back across and approaching that windward mark, sort of in that uh, top few boats on that uh, port, or not on the port ley line, but just down from it. About eight and a half knots of breeze and it is in this left phase, so we do have quite a hard pin-end uh, bias at the moment. Well, let's see if that pin-end bias does convince people to fight for the left-hand end. It does look like there's more interest in the pin-end this time round. Just 10 seconds to go, and it looks like boat number seven is in a good position to secure this, and this is the French. Um, who mucked up the previous start, Club de Voile Santo Van El Boeuf, but this time they absolutely nailed the pin end start and they, that puts their, the French in a very strong position coming off this start line with boat number three, Yacht Club Bregenz from Austria, one of their chief rivals for the overall title. The, the Austrians being spat out the back, as you can already see there, and being forced to make an early tack out. So round one, goes to the French on board Club de Voile saint aubin el -Boeuf. Um And it's another Austrian team just up on their shoulder, Borgenländische Yacht Club, um, who are their closest rivals right now. So uh, can the Austrians hold on the French and um, can it be the Austrians that dictate when these two boats tack over? We're on board here with uh, Cedric Chateau, who's looking to tack, and he sees the Austrians tack, so now he is allowed to tack as well. So I would say in these early stages that things are looking very nice for the French, but also for the Austrians in boat number one, the dark blue sail just uh, behind boat number seven. 
Yeah, great start. Exactly where we've seen these lead boats coming from, that pin end. Again, the French team, uh, Club de Voix, saint aubin and Leboeuf, uh, having to just shoot the mark a little bit, but then they stayed within quite a high mode. It was interesting. They didn't drop the bow down. They stayed in that high mode, looking to close that gap and force those other boats out towards that right-hand side. And this is the controlling position. Even with those boats approaching from that right, they're going to struggle with this breeze. This breeze starting to track a little bit towards that right, but better breeze on this left-hand side, up to about uh, nine knots again. So we're sitting between eight to nine knots, but that breeze always just looking a little softer on that right-hand side. Even though this wind's starting to track right, it looks like there's a little bit of advantage, but now straight away again, 30 seconds later, we're coming back to that left-hand side. So advantage to the boats on this left-hand side of the track. The purple boat on the right-hand side of our picture is Regatta Club Oberhofen from Switzerland. And will they be able to use the power of the left to get themselves back into contention? Because at the moment, that Swiss team are on the back foot. They are struggling to make up the ground after a, a poor start. As the, the leading boats get into the top third of this first beat, it still looks like um, there's a, a bit of a battle going on between the Austrians on board uh, Bogen Lendersche um, and just over their shoulder, uh, the Club de Bois Santo Buen. But we are on board with um, Bogen, Bogen Lendersche Yacht Club. So potentially these are the leaders. And, and when you see um, boat number seven just at the back of the picture, it looks like the Austrians are very much in control of this little match race going on, potentially in a strong position to be squeeze. leading yeah. around. So yes, they, they are squeezing, but no, it's the French that have the ability to tack first. So the French just, I would say, holding on to the lead and are about to hoist their spinnaker just in front of the Austrian crew. And a very, very slick set by the French, followed by the Austrians. Pretty good set, but not quite as good as the leaders. And then a lot of congestion as, as we go around. The purple boat, boat number six, having to just do a double luff there just to make sure that it doesn't foul boat number eight. And going around um, boat number two, the red boat is uh, JK Aurora from Slovenia. Well, very interesting. Again, J70s, they they're like any other boat. They like a bit of momentum once they pick up their pace. And we still see the crews being very aggressive with these turns and trying to actually really just change direction very hard. When you what think we... too hard? Is that what you're saying, that they're, they're putting the brakes on? Well, it was, it was just interesting because, uh, say, uh, watching... Uh, uh, Borg and Landisher come round that mark, even though they were slightly higher above that line. As they came round, it was a smoother entry, and even though it, uh, their hoist wasn't as good, they closed the gap a little bit on Club de Voile, saint Alban, or Boeuf, um, who were out in front, but they were just a bit smoother, and it just carried that momentum around. Certainly in the areas of a gate or a windward mark where you're bunching up, having that little bit of momentum that gives you those extra metre, metre and a half. They're not going to, you know, you're certainly not going to carry on mounts of uh, distance, but being able to give you that bit of breathing space. And again, with this breeze towards that uh, left side, it tracking a little bit towards the right, which is why we've seen York Club uh, Brigens. Um, and JK Aurora just taking that uh, shift out. But again, very interesting that uh, York Club uh, Brigens, they're really battling it out, and they've again taken that shift out early, but they are off the back of this lead group. And, yeah, so this is the first time we've seen anyone take early jibes down these runs, and uh, so quite a brave move by Yacht Club Brigens in the, the yellow Jenica at the back of the picture, and I wonder if that really has done them any favours at all. It forces them off round the other mark, which we've tended to see as the disadvantaged mark, whilst the leaders all choose to go round the left-hand side of the course. Well, even though they're not racing, the Italians that are sitting at the top of the leaderboard... Uh, Circolo della Velabari. They're, you know, interestingly, they're sat at the top of the leaderboard, and the battle that's going on is between their next two rivals, the French, the Club de Voile Saint Alban El Boeuf, and the Yacht Club Brigens. Currently, obviously, the uh, French are out in front, but that would still give them a five point cushion to that French team. And then uh, one point back from them within the current situation of where Yacht Club uh, Brigens is would see that battle on. So actually, the Italians are probably. 
quite enjoying this race going on, knowing that if they secure a first or a second sort of position, could completely change the dynamics of this and sit quite comfortably at the top of the table. Wow. So even though Club de Voile, Santo Ban, Albert for leading this race, um, even if they win that race, they can't do better than that. They still got quite a lot of work to get their way back up towards the Italians. That's um, well, that's reassuring for the Italians. Um, that, that goes to show just what a cushion is developing for the team from Bari in terms of winning this event overall. Uh, but that won't be on the mind of Cedric Chateau or any of the crew on board the boat from St. Alban. Uh, all they're doing is living in the moment, making sure that they sail that boat as well as they possibly can. And the boat that they are most focused on right now is the second place team from Austria, Borgenländische Yacht Club, in the dark blue boat in the middle of our picture right now. With the Finnish crew from Olenska Segal Salskapet in third. So you can see boats one, two, three, um, it, ranged in a row. We're on board here with the Austrians um, and you can see the race leaders in boat number seven just on the right of our screen right now. So very similar picture to the one that we saw on the previous beat except that this time the French have good clear air between themselves and the Austrians. Well, and this shot again just looks like the French have that little bit more height as well. They're climbing up out of there just freeing that little bit of space and that's coming into sort of uh, having a look at where the breeze is. It's moved around towards that left hand side but now we're starting to see that breeze drop into this right face. Perfect timing for these guys now tacking out onto starboard looking for that right side of the face and it's now instantly starting to track back towards that left hand side. As soon as we see that breeze start to shift they're in complete control of this. The question is, are they on that ley line or have they gone that little bit further? And if they are, then you can see the other two boats just sailing that additional distance. There's the mark in shot. So nice and comfortable on this ley line. So it's all setting up very nicely for Club de Voile, saint Urbain, Ulbeth. Some boats coming in on the port tack li ley line. Um, one of those is Hellerup Sail Club. What are they gonna try and do here? Surely they're not gonna think that they can get in there and get away with it. There's got to be a red flag going out here. There's the whistle. Let's see what flag goes up and who it gets pointed at. But surely in second place, Hellerup Sail Club will not be allowed to keep that. No, they, the uh, Danes have been forced to take a penalty turn. And it was the red mist de descending. And uh, what, what a, an expensive mistake that will have proved to be. They will have dropped from second, although it wasn't ever really a second place. Um, it was a bit, very cheeky second place for about two or three seconds. Um, so uh, very short-lived glory as they find themselves dropping back to sixth place, from second to sixth place after that single penalty. And it all plays into the hands oh, of the leaders of the this race. There's the whistle of another. You can hear the whistle in the, uh, the background. So um, what else is being applied? Just trying to look back at who else might have picked up a penalty, where it is, what's going on. The drone spinning around to have a look back. And oh. someone is trying to do a penalty with their Jenica fully the hoisted. I, I just wonder, why does anyone think that that's going to be a good way to do a penalty? Well, again, have they got it, away with it? It's, it's, Maybe again, they have. it's Heller Up Sail Club again. And so whether they hadn't taken that initial penalty and the umpire was just clearly identifying it again, but... They certainly look like they've either picked up another penalty or this is still the existing penalty that they haven't done. But in all fairness, they've made a right hash of that at the moment. They like certainly using... have. I mean, ju just uh, the, it's so easy to say from the commentary box with the overhead, you know, seagull shot that we've got here. So I, I don't want to judge them too harshly because we all make these mistakes when we're in the thick of it. But I mean, seriously, how did they ever think that they were going to get away with that? port tack that, that coming in on the ley line and secondly when you've got a penalty just as the helm wait for the crew to get the kite down don't think that you can turn one of these boats around 360 degrees with the jennica up well even if you somehow manage it you can do it in a slightly stronger breeze but you get a bit of momentum but the chances of getting a wrap in that kite are just so high and that if you end up with a wrap and you end up that's it doing it all over the time and we sit there joking about this but actually Way out in front, Club de Voile, Santo Banel, Berth taking a win, but what a race coming in right to the finish line here. Borgen Landesha, Nalanska Sierskut oh, just squeezing in, and Regatta Club Overhofen squeezing in, so it was neck and neck, so the finish being squeezed out of the back, but certainly for second or third, 
At the, the moment, analytics. it looks like it's gone to Regatta Club Oberhofen, who have just sneaked it from Bogen Lendersche Yacht Club. That really was as close as we've seen. And so uh, I'm not sure that we can definitively say that that was the, uh, the finishing score, just because we're seeing it on the screen. But for the time being, we have to say that the Swiss just got the better of the Austrians for second and third place, with uh, just behind them, the Finnish team that we're on board with now, um, Orlenska coming in in fourth place. What a tight finish Again, just at the end. Again, all came down to Regatta Club Ovenhofen taking that jibe earlier. Running down on an earlier jibe, they were inside that lay line, so they uh, were reliant on that bit of breeze. But as the breeze tracked around towards that uh, left-hand side again, it gave them that option to be able to just soak that a little bit further. And that gave them the speed into that finish. And that one extra place, it's all going to help. Those moments are the decisive moments, aren't they? Those, those, those key moments where did your spinnaker get seen across the finish line by the committee, race committee before the other spinnaker? So little to choose between those two boats right there and then. Well, really interesting. Again, sort of uh, just tracking back to that leaderboard, those two uh, boats fighting for second and third. They've got a bit of breathing space behind them, but also a bit of breathing space opening up for the, the lead boat as well at the moment. So in second and third, even though uh, Club de Voile, Central Ban, El Berf are winning that race, they trail five points behind the Italians, uh, Socolo de Velabari. They are still leading. They haven't raced in this flight yet, so it's going to matter where they finish, and that could change the point. But Yacht Club, again, slipping up and not being such a consistent day for them today, picking up the five points. They're on equal points for second and third, but again, a little bit of space behind those teams. So you can see the teams on board uh, Matilda just enjoying a bit of uh, breeze, keeping the track on sort of what's going on on that race course. All looking fairly comfortable. And so uh, it's a question in, in those uh, down mo downtime moments. Uh, do you spend your time watching the race course, seeing what's going on when you're not racing? Or do you use the time to relax and, and completely get your head out of the sailing altogether? It's a combination, depending on how your race has gone. I think sort of if, uh, if you've won a race, it's great just to say, well... You know, we had a great start. That worked out. We sailed our strategy. We were pleased with it. We felt the wind was doing this. And you cover those couple of key points just over a couple of minutes. And then that is your time. That's when you, you know, pick up a drink, have a bit of food. You switch off and you enjoy a bit of the race. And you enjoy while you're there. If you stay so analytical about your race or what's going on, well, the amount that it's changing out on the water with the shifts, what's happening, and also the format with this uh, league style racing is it all comes down to where everyone else finishes and how the races pan out. So at the moment, you know, the Italians haven't done anything, you know, mesmerizing. They've just managed to uh, keep consistent. Uh, we have completed race one of the penultimate flight here. So we've, we've only got a few races to run. Let's see how things are shaping up, bearing in mind that this isn't a, a truly reflective um, leaderboard right now. Yeah, so those gaps obviously that are, aren't filled in on F17 for the Fly 17 are the ones that are going to now fill in over the next two races. Um, but you can see, with the, as we were talking about, the Socolo della Velabari sitting at the top with 40 points. They haven't raced, so again, but if they secure a top one, two, three in a consistent place, they still will have a bit of breathing space uh, back to the French, the Club de Voile, saint Alban et le And so we can see how the Yacht Club Brigands with that fifth had hindered them and that was their opportunity again to uh, claw back a few points and keep that tight. So at the moment, we could see a little bit of breathing space for the Italians at the top, but again, a little bit of breathing space for second and third back to fourth. For a Gatting Club, Bowden C still haven't raced. But again, we can already see a seven-point difference. So even if they get a win, that's going to be an eight-point gap. Um, no, and the ones that... Uh, this was where it's really shaking up and sort of on that story again is that 14th uh, position. Jock Club is shaving again uh, down in, with 17, uh, 70 points. But look, just one point in front, 69 points, APCC Nance. And that is the deciding factor. So there's still space for those boats to uh, radically change. Uh, Cape Crow Yacht Club with their win, just giving themselves a couple of points at the front. But still, that qualification place is all still to fight for. 
So we have one and a half minutes to the start of race two in flight 17. And uh, the umpires are just uh, getting together as they always do, just uh, sharing thoughts and ideas from what happened previously and uh, a bit of collision. I wonder what who calls the umpires when the two umpires have collisions on their ribs? Who, who gives them a penalty turn? I think it's all sorted in the bar later on, isn't it? And uh, it's sort of a, an apology. And But seems very keen that he's realised he's got to be somewhere. So now might whiz over to the start line, get all set back up. So the umpires do an amazing job. So they run, uh, we've got six ribs out on there so they can keep in track of the flights with uh, an, an umpire on each. Obviously in different uh, classes, they run two umpires in a boat so it allows them to talk through the situations. Um, but they do an amazing job with the amount of racing again. So we're uh, into race 50 at the moment and they've actually been in every single one of them. So um Fair play to uh, the umpires out there. That, so that was the uh, the signal for the one minute. So just 50 seconds now, and uh, not much of a pattern yet. Um, there's a few boats look look like they're holding out for the committee boat end of the line. Interesting, though, three boats over towards that pin end. This is the first time we've seen, actually, boats approaching from a port approach and wanting to favour that. They will probably sail right into the fleet and tack underneath them without having to give anything too much away from that port end. But interesting, there's different approaches coming in play now. Yes, you're right. So so some fairly late tacks going on here between the, uh, the boat number three and boat number two that look like they're very keen on securing that end of the line. So... Um, uh, boat number two is uh, Club de Voile Santo Ban Elberf, who just won the previous race. Uh, we're on board with one of the Swedish crews. I couldn't quite catch who that was, but it looks like uh, it's going to be boat number three that gets the pin, but a very, very good start uh, for boat number two for the French, um, who are really sailing extremely well at the moment and doing everything they can to get back into contention in the overall lead. Uh, so a solid start for Cedric Chateau. Uh, we're on board here with Malmö Segel Salskarpet, skippered by Martin Fried. Yeah, so a great, again, the best starts coming off from this pin end again, the breeze, even though it's tracking around a little bit, it's still just staying in more this left side, um, kind of a left face, but, uh, yeah, a hard position here for looking at uh, boat number three. On this left-hand side is uh, Yacht Club at Schievenigen. They uh, are struggling down on this uh, early lay when they go for a tack out. If they, the problem is with this position, they'll tack. If they want to duck someone, it's easy for these boats on these short courses just to tack with them. So they're going to have to tack quite late out. So there's the tack. Question will be how many boats are going to go with them or how many boats have gone in front of them. So uh, Regatta Club, uh, Regatta Club Bordensi taking that tack early. They might have to go for one duck here just behind the Swedish. Um, so playing so nicely are. into the hands of boat number two, closest to picture Club de Voile Santo Ban, who already look in a strong commanding position with the purple boat um, next over on the, uh, the right-hand side of the French, being Malmö from Sweden. Oh, sorry, I'm uh, Cecilo della Velabari. I've been misreading uh, the uh, the boat number two. It's actually the Italians that are leading um, overall. So apologies for that. Um, it's the Italians that are already the overall series leaders that have put themselves in a strong position. Well, and as they with exactly what they wanted to do, come off uh, out of the blocks, absolutely firing. They need a solid result. This is their time to really capitalise on the mistakes that have been made in the other races from the other teams. And so if they do this and the points sit in this position, they will uh, quite comfortably have a four-point gap going into that uh, final flight, which is going to be some uh, some margin considering the level of the sailors and the consistency we've seen it by no means means that's a write-off and it's all done and dusted but it's uh it certainly gives them a, a comfortable buffer 
And it just seems to be getting better and better for the Italians right now. Uh, they are very tight up on that ley line, as, as you can see on the graphic there. Uh, but the breeze, as it has done for most of the day, seems to be very strong on that left-hand side, both in terms of direction and wind strength. And the boats coming in on the starboard side of the race course really are no threat whatsoever to the leaders. It's not to say that some of the, there won't be some shenanigans going on further back in the fleet, but a very easy first beat for the Italians having won that pin end of the start. We're on board with Malmo in the thick of it. The Italians already with their Jenica up have managed to stay clear of the melee, but there are probably going to be penalties coming out of the centre part of this, uh, this race course. So it looks like everyone has more or less managed to stay clean on each other, um, but a lot of traffic and a lot of bad air being put onto each other in the, the middle of this pack right now. You can see how congested it gets when uh, the boats are so tied together and going round this windward mark, how much they bunch up the short course racing that's exactly where it's at and you can see why one mistake or one slip up on the start or a penalty can just shuffle you to the back of this fleet and then it's a long way through that fleet to get to that clear air that these guys have out in front Della Bari, very comfortable a little bit of breathing space as well exactly where they need to be but with uh, the Swedish and the Swiss breathing down their neck they cannot be complacent. This breeze, again, when we got towards that top part of the race course, moving around towards that left-hand side, advantage to the left, and that's where the uh, the gain's coming in. Just we tracking slightly to the right, which is why we've seen uh, a couple of boats jibe off and try and make use of that. Yacht Club Monaco and uh, Yacht Club Scheveningen. Uh, um, yeah, I think it's uh, GVK Plateau was, was maybe the other boat. Or is it Yacht Club Monaco that went into the middle? Sorry, it was. You're right. Um, so <laughs> um, I'm quite surprised to see those two boats do that. We haven't seen it work for, for anybody else so far. So the early jibe, um, normally under normal conditions, uh, when it's not quite so one-sided, maybe that's a good option. Um, but I'd be surprised if that works out for... Uh, Yacht Club Monaco or Shaveningen. They're coming in with a bit more speed, though. They've held a slightly higher angle, but it is completely where these boats come in here. So now, left of picture, we can see GVK uh, Plateau 25 Association. They have quite a nice sort of line on here, but the speed has carried these guys round in front of those boats. Late drops coming in to enable that speed to speed momentum as they go round. We can't see them in picture at the moment, but Malmo really made a very poor rounding on that mark and uh, didn't manage to hold the high line uh, out of the lower mark. That's going to put the Swedes at some disadvantage. We're on board with them now, and they've given themselves a lot more work to do. If they just had been a little bit tidier with their kite drop and, and thought more about positioning and less about speed, they may not be in the trouble that they are now trying to uh, look for a, a clear lane to go across. So now they're thinking about it, and Malmo are putting that tack in, and will they be able to find their way to a clear lane on port tack? Because they've got a, a lot of sailing to do to, to get back across, and you want to be doing that in clear air if you possibly can. Well, interesting. They've tacked pretty much on the line. There we see just up on the hip of Circolo della Velabari. So they do have a clear lane, but they are the furthest boat out towards this left. And again, we say this as it's you know, a bit of a, a problem. Well, actually, even if you're sort of right up onto that left-hand side and overlaying a bit, it's still more beneficial than heading towards that right-hand side. And so, yes, poor rounding. They've dropped that uh, distance between those front two boats, and that's something they're going to have to play catch-up on. But again, we'll see Regatta Club Boldensea come back on starboard. And in the current situation, with the clear air they've got, the added distance on that left-hand side, as from where I've got them, they're still on that inside of that uh, ley line, and so it should be quite comfortable. Breeze now starting to tickle up more towards just under 10 knots again, and it's favouring this left-hand side. So we could see, we now see they're powered up quite nicely. The only distance they've lost is because of that lured mark rounding, and that's something they're just going to have to suck up and deal with. But uh, they are on this left-hand side. It just depends on how much they can uh, hold on to this position and not lose any further distance and allow the Yacht Club Monaco and Yacht Club Scheveningen to be able to uh, make that jump.
And normally you're not rewarded in sailing for banging corners, but today it seems like banging the corner is, is maybe the more conservative decision. I don't think it's necessarily banging a corner. It's just you've got to be just consistent on this left-hand side. But look, here we see the gap really coming back. You'll see them go for that tack straight in on that hip. And as long as they clear that, there's no rules going involved here. So they're back up into second. So even though the rounding was uh, not wonderful, they're still tight on the transom of that lead boat. Well, they've actually made a gain on the lead boat. So, so it just goes to show how powerful it is to go up on the left. They went further up to the left-hand side, not very far on the Italians, but, but that little extra distance has, has really paid dividends for the Swedes. So it, it does seem like you're, you're not rewarded for doing anything in the middle of this racetrack right now. Well, and, and, it, and it, seems, it seems odd. OK, again, it's something that's nice and easy for us to sit here. We've got our analytics and overviews and drones and all sorts of things. But over the races, for all the sailors to look at this, is that why they're not protecting that left-hand side a little bit more? You know, OK, if you're a lead boat, you take that shift when you like. And as long as you track back in from mid-left side, you're generally in a great position. It's a nice commanding position. But if you are trying to gain some boats, just smashing out to that right-hand side in the hope of it is not worked once yet. No. No, it's, it's, it's really quite a risky move, and, and it, it's just very untextbook what we're seeing right now. And you know what? Malmo are in such a strong position on the Italians that they actually have a sniff of being able to overtake the Italians. They've really managed to work a good low lane now to the point where they almost have an overlap on the Italians. And this race win for the Italians in boat number two is no longer a given. I mean, they've, they've looked so strong throughout this race all the way from the start. And now it looks like Malmo, after making a bit of a mess of that lured mark rounding, are in a strong position to attack for winning this race. And that's what some of the other teams need to see happen because these Italians have been beginning to run away with this competition. Um, but now there's a Swedish crew that are showing that, no, we're, we're not going to let you win this easily in Portocevo and home waters. You're really going to have to work for this all the way to the finish. And to reinforce exactly that, boat speeds, again, very similar between these lead two boats, but Malmo a little bit, um, a little bit quicker. And uh, Malmo, it, they've just done a simultaneous jibe, and now is the moment of truth. Are they going to be able to roll over the top? But the Italians have luffed, and then they dive back down again. Malmo are floundering. They might even lose second place. Are they going to hold on to second? Yes, they do. But is there a penalty to be taken out of all of that? I wonder. There's a red flag flying. Who's the red flag going on to? And Corky reckons the red flag is pointing at the red spinnaker going down on the Italian boat. Surely not. Will it be the winners of that race across the finish line who are now... No, it's, it looks like it's Malmo. Looks like Malmo are turning up into the breeze and they haven't yet got their Jenica down. Um, but it looks to me like Malmo are recrossing the line and we're on board with them now. Hmm. Not yeah, quite sure what's going on here, but it, we, it, it, looks, it looks like they are taking that penalty turn and Malmo, from, for threatening for the lead and the race win, have had to take that penalty and that has been a disastrous finish to what was a really, really good race for the Swedes up until those dying seconds. Just got a little bit greedy and it's just all gone against the Swedes right at the end. And so the Italians end up winning that race and further extending their overall lead in the semi-final in Portocevo. Well, it all just dials back to exactly when they both jibed. The Swedes jibing on the inside. They were the quicker boat downwind. They got that inside line. They had that nice jibe. They were trying to keep a bit of distance and the Italians just slowly started to creep up on them. And that was it. Windward lure didn't keep clear. They didn't alter course. The gap closed. There was a bit of a luff and uh, stuff up from uh, the Italians there. And that's where the umpires found that they uh, fouled the rules. So, as you say, a cruel, cruel place to where you've nearly taken first place. Second would have been fantastic, even that. But because you've gone risky biscuit for it and you've ended up trying to push all the way, it ended up with a penalty in you're back of the fleet. It's a, it's a bit of Swedish red mist we saw there, really, isn't oh. it? I mean, in the scheme of things, does first or second really matter? Well, yeah, it does matter, but you don't want to be sacrificing second place 
um, in the way that we just saw. Again, really easy to say here from the commentary position when you're in the heat of it and you think you've got a sniff of the kill and you think you might actually win a race and then um, you just take that extra risk that you really didn't need to take. What a shame for the Swedes. Well, again, that leaderboard now with that little bit of breathing space at the top, but all still to uh, pull up. We're going to try and we've got, again, still one more race uh, to complete, flight uh, 17. But it, you can see how that leads are shaping up. And also, again, that battle for qualification, all looking very interesting at the moment. So we're just working on getting that leaderboard up so we can have a, a little look at that. But... Just amazing racing, and it shows that sort of uh, that's what it's all about. Coming right down to that line, people pushing all the way through, and it is down to that consistency, not making those mistakes, not getting picking up those penalties. We've got one more race in this flight, and then a final flight, a flight 18, which will be the decider. And again, it's easy to say, well, you know, the Italians are running away, f are run are running away with it, but actually, with no discards, it's very easy to pick up just one bad race be too early on the start be pick up a penalty and suddenly pick up seven or eight points and that could just change the leaderboard completely so let's have a look at that leaderboard after italy win the race that we just saw in such extraordinary circumstances so we're, with just one race left for the italians to do in the final flight flight 18 yet to be played out um corky do you think anyone realistically can take it away from them well again there's an, always an outside uh, chance that they overdo the line, have to return, pick up a penalty. And, you know, there's not a four points, OK? The next race, five points, even if they get a first. But again, that's seeing them pretty much towards the back of the fleet. And we've not really seen that looking at their points across there. We've seen a fifth, we've seen a fourth. But consistently, we've seen them very, very solid throughout this uh, these few days and I'd be surprised they would be uh, willing to throw that away they know they've just got to get off that start line cleanly and as long as they stay within that top three four boats then they're happy days let's have a look at the second part of the leaderboard and see who's on the cusp of going through for a spot in San Moritz for the finals later on this summer so 14 is the magic number so APCC Nantes from France, just sitting on the right side of that cutoff and just at the start of the drop zone, not quite making it right now, are the Dutch team of WSV Hiesbeek. And on similar points, on the same points, in fact, of 77, are the Austrians Borgen Lendische Yacht Club. So some crucial races coming up for the Dutch and the Austrians if they're going to have a chance of going through. And Malmo Segel Salskapet, the boat that we saw just then, um, they got eight points from that last race. They could have got two points if they'd just been a bit less greedy. And they also would still be in with a decent chance of going through. So that, that right there for Malmo might be the point where they just missed out on a spot for the finals in San Moritz. So we're on board with... Well, one of the German teams, um, Wassersportverein Hemelingen, skippered by Jan Zekamp. Okay, so again, while uh, we're here in the commentary booth, we use uh, the SAP Sailing Analytics, and it allows us to really delve down into the details of what's going on on the race course, the individuals, but again, the leaderboard and likewise. It's accessible for all of you at home, anywhere when you're out and about. So head to sapsailing.com. <clears throat> of course, we are looking at the Sailing Champions League, the semi-final one. So click on to that, uh, that link and you'll instantly be brought to this home page here. We have four tabs just underneath the title, the overview, the races, the leaderboard and competitor analytics. And so you can see just below that, it says live now. F18, which is flight 18 at race three, is uh, going to get underway very shortly. But if you'd like just to track down the leaderboard, across onto that third tab and click the leaderboard. Instantly, you can see all of the results, all the teams. But one focus point is this red button. If your button's not glowing red, um, it just means it's not on the auto update. So that's a little symbol there. If you just click it and it glows red, you'll instantly see the boat numbers in the race 
that are red are instantly automatically updating as that race goes on. So as a person moves from fifth to fourth in a race, that will change the points straight away and your leaderboard will be live and updated. So you can see there's uh, the red final column there still means it's live and it's updated. And so once we're into that race, it will be into that. The second tab, just going across the races, you can see we're nearly underway with the next race. So if you just click the watch live button, it will load up your race course with the next section. And we are straight into what we can see with the racing and the boat over towards the left hand side. And so as you can see from the countdown, we've got a one just over one minute to the start. So let's go straight in and join race three in flight 17. 55 seconds to go. And we have definitely seen what works and what doesn't work on this race course. Much more of a pattern today than what we saw yesterday, where we saw much more of an open race course. This surely has to be about winning the left and protecting the left-hand side of this race course. 33 seconds to go. And still no one that close to the pin end, the red mark at the bottom of our screen, um, but still plenty of time in this good breeze for the boats to accelerate towards that. Um, at the moment, um, I think, I can't tell for sure, but I think it's boat number four, is it, um, that's closest to the pin end? Well, again, really surprising. Well, actually, no surprise. The breeze round towards this left-hand side. We can see how tight, actually, these boats are already up on the wind, trying to squeeze for that line. The gun goes there, and we're still... Boats are at full speed, trying to get over this line. There's a little bit of a drag down to it. But you can see how much this left-hand side is favoured. They've squeezed up and shot the mark there, trying to get over, so... It's uh, the Italians... Uh... Sochieta Canottieri Garda Salo from Lake Garda, who got the pin end, but a very strong start just on their hip uh, from RS280 in boat seven. And one boat going out to the far right hand side all by itself is Wassersport Verein Hemelingen. So the Germans uh, really pushing out on their own and looking for something on the right hand side. Will they be able to buck the trend? and prove that the right has something to offer after the left has really been the, the strong card so far today. A lot of slop, a lot of chop, and it seems like the breeze is a little bit lighter, so harder to keep on the boat speed than it has been in previous races. Nice tack there by the, uh, the yellow-sailed boat sailed by the Italians from Lake Garda, who are looking in a pretty strong position now on port tack. The boat number eight, still on the, the bottom right-hand side of our screen, is Cape Crow Yacht Club, winner of the last race in which they competed, uh, but with a little bit more work to do, not looking so strong. But clearly the Swedes and also the Danish women from the Royal Danish Yacht Club really want this left-hand side. We can see them, see them at the bottom of our screen right now, but really pushing out towards the left-hand side. And that's Cape Crow in the yellow shirts and the light blue number eight in the front of our screen right now. Um, they've gone an awful long way over to this left-hand side. Have they overstood the ley line? If they haven't, then they could be in a good position to do well here. Well, looking at the uh, analytics, it looks like they're pretty much on it or just below it. So any shift in that breeze is going to, to alter. We are seeing that breeze track around sort of about 5, 10 degrees on this left side, but it's staying in that left side phase. So it'll be really interesting to see when the German team far out on that right side in the distance of this picture, when they tack and start to come back across, how they actually stack up against these boats towards that left-hand side. So we've always talked about protecting that uh, mid to left. These guys were quite a long way back, Cape Crow Yacht Club. Not a great start. And uh, you can see them sort of clearly back from all the transoms, but are staying on this favoured left-hand side. The breeze back up to them about nine, nine and a half knots. So we'll see how they come in on this mark and whether they make these gains into it. But they're not far off the back with the distance they've got. I'm surprised they went as far as they did because they didn't need to go as far as they did to keep their air clear. So Cape Crow gone a lot further over to the left than tactically they needed to. So they, they, the Swedes clearly like the left and it forced the Danes, who we haven't even seen in picture recently, to go even further over to the left to maintain clear air coming back across 
uh, on on the ley line towards the top mark. Um, but the uh, the Swedes and the Danes um, at the bottom of our picture are playing a risky game, especially when you consider that they're going to be port tack boat against the sub attackers coming in at the the top of the course on the uh, the two converging ley lines. And now the question for the Italians is: Have they done enough to get ahead? of Wassersport Verein Hemelingen, who so bravely went on their own out towards the right-hand side. And you know what? It's not done the Germans too badly at all. They're pretty much neck and neck with the Italians. And that's the first time we've seen a boat come in from the right-hand side and do so well, to the point where the Germans almost look like have, they have the opportunity to roll over the top of the Italians. Now it's a question of who can get the better spinnaker hoist. Will it be the Italians doing the harder turn or the Germans doing the, the smoother, wider turn? Who will get the Jenica up and running? It looks like the Italians have just got away with it, but well, the sails are a bit soft. Now there's an opportunity for the Germans to roll over the top and take the air of the Italians. So absolute neck and neck fight for the race lead. No clear leader right now. A lot of traffic in the middle of the picture and, and you know what, the, the top two have not made the uh, the best course down towards the uh, the bottom of the run. There's an opportunity for WSV Riesbeek in third place for the Dutch to start attacking the inside line of the front two. So it's almost turning into a three-way battle for the lead right now and you can see that beautifully portrayed in this shot that we see uh, from on board uh, one of the lead boats from the uh, the German boat Wassersport Verein Hemmelingen. And from this angle, it looks like a nice position for the Germans, but the reality is that the Germans have a long way to sail around the outside. But as I say that, uh, the Italians have really fall fallen into the bad air of Germany, and Germany at the moment is in the box seat. Still with a lot of work to do, but... Uh, that's definitely round one to the Germans in terms of that particular fight between Germany and Italy. Yeah, and very much so. It's actually then put them into a tricky position because you look at WSV Hiesbeck sort of tucking in on that inside. Again, they're in a nice commanding position of there's no option for the Italians to jibe out either. And depending on how soft they go on this uh, run on the way down, at the moment, it's all looking pretty similar across that race course. They're staying on this left part of the course but soon they'll look to start to go for these jibes. You can see the German team constantly looking back, looking at where that mark is, wanting to get that jibe in early. You'll see a fairly simultaneous jibing pattern all go across and try and cover each other. But this could see the disadvantage be a really struggle from the Italians, but you can see they're being squeezed by WSV Hiesbeck. There is no way the Germans will potentially try and get a jibe out. You can see the arm going back on a call. Now they want to go it. Will they clear it back? Now the Italians have to change their plan, change their tactics, go for that high bit. They'll go for an aggressive jibe here that will punch in behind where the German team right on the hinder there. So we can see where the gate is and guess who's going to come out top on this because they've got two oh. blinkered. A massive connection from WSV Heesbeck. There's the nice jibe. They're the ones that are going to capitalize on that silly blinkered move from those guys there. Down comes the kite. They will lead round this gate. So what a giveaway by the top two boats and, and what a gift for WSV Heesbeck. The Dutch now moving into the lead. Very, very tight handbrake turn by the Italians who move up into second. And the big losers... Out of that whole rounding are Hamerlingen from Germany, who have now pushed round the outside. And, the, and now there's another boat that moves up on the inside of them. Is it the Royal Danish Yacht Club? Um, oh, they can't get their spinnaker down. What a shame for the boat number four, still trying to get their spinnaker down. They got such a good rounding, but that spinnaker, that late drop, has, uh, has not helped them out. So there's a bit of a restart for, for some of these boats, uh, but what a gr great uh, maneuver there by WSV Heesbeck. The Dutch moving into the lead in this race after capitalizing on the area, uh, error by the Italians and the Germans. And that's exactly it. Now, this is where the pressure's really starting to mount in these final few races. This is where the points win or lose. We know that uh, WSV Heesbeck 
we see are battling it out for trying to squeeze themselves into that 14th uh, spot. They are just outside that spot at the moment. So they need a race win. They need to secure these top points and give themselves the best opportunity. So a fantastic move to push them into that position. You can see the commanding role they are in at the moment. But teams all starting to try and push a lot harder. Some silly mistakes coming in. Kite's not coming down. But again, blinkered uh, battles of boat on boat, looking at one boat, trying to close them off and forgetting totally about the boat that's just sat on their hip. And so fantastic uh, tactics come in from the Dutch team there and in the commanding control of Race 3 Flight 17. Yes, it'd be so easy to say that uh, boat number six, the Dutch leading this race, uh, have got it all in the bag. But we've seen some strange uh, changes take place quite quickly on this race course. And uh, Cape Crow Yacht Club up into, uh, well, I just said third place, and then it switches to fourth or fifth. So it goes to show how tight it is. But Cape Crow Yacht Club, who wanted the left-hand side so badly on the previous beat find themselves on the right-hand side of the course, but they're tacking back in towards the left. And it's Ubelingen on um, the far left-hand side that are trying to make up the ground from, from the left. And will they be able to come back into contention? Because so often we see the left pay very well, they, nicely. Well, they're having a bit of a shocker. The last race uh, in flight uh, 16, they finished with a seventh, and currently they're in seventh now. So they've, they're picking up a lot of points in these final flights. And uh, it's seeing them certainly out of contention for a podium spot, but uh, obviously they're very comfortable within the qualification spot. And here they are appearing in Seattle and uh, Cape Crow, just taking that tack straight in front of them and giving them some dirty air, which I'm sure they'll be very pleased about. <laughs> They're going to have to live in that bad air for quite some time uh, before they get over to the ley line and, and are in a position to tack. And taking two clearing tacks in this kind of breeze in a J70 just isn't worth it. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard medicine to swallow, but it's probably the lesser of two evils. So WSB Griesbeck tacking on the ley line onto starboard and that will be their final tack of this race and at the moment they have quite a healthy lead on Societa Canottieri Garda Salo the Italians in second place and the Royal, da uh, Royal Danish Yacht Club fighting it out with Wassersportverein Hemmelingen from Germany previous leaders of this race who made such a an error of the uh, the mark rounding at the bottom of this race course. Germans really struggling to salvage a decent finish out of the race that they were leading. Well, interesting. Lots of support right at the right times for the Italian team and also for the uh, Dutch team that are leading WSV Hiesbeck. They're uh, all being support on Facebook. The comments, go, 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 go and win. Go and push, go. And so lots of support, which is fantastic. So the Danish women from Royal Danish Yacht Club in uh, boat number four, they're around in third place. Um, and then it's boat number eight uh, that goes round after them. And that is Cape Crow Yacht Club. So um, Cape Crow Yacht Club up to fourth place. So banging out to the left-hand side at the top second half of that beat has actually moved them ahead of Wassersport Verein Hamerling. And so things are going from uh, good to bad to worse for the Germans that were previously leading this race and, and a good comeback by Cape Crow Yacht Club um, who are in contention potentially for taking third spot off Royal Danish Yacht Club. So a bit of a battle going on for third spot in this race, but a very straightforward lead as we see it at the moment for WSV Hispake. So the graphic shows us that Cape Crow Yacht Club is in a good attacking position to be able to take third place away from the Danes. And we can expect to see a close battle between the, the young men uh, from Cape Crow and the young women from Royal Danish Yacht Club as we come into the closing stages of this final run to the finish in race three of flight 17. This is the final race of the penultimate flight. Uh, we've only got flight 18 to run, so everyone will have completed all but their final race when we get to the finish of this race. And we're looking backwards from the second place boat 
uh, the Italians from Lake Garda just on that onboard shot. Um, and their second place is by no means secure. The, the only boat that's looking comfortable right now is, is this boat, the, uh, the, the Dutch team from uh, WSB Hiesbeek uh, that are just going into what will probably be their final manoeuvre of this race as they aim towards the finish line and sail to what looks like will be a very comfortable victory for the Dutch who have sailed a, a really smart tactical race. Even though they have, looking at that, they're still the angle. They're all soaking down quite deep into this pocket and calling the jibe quite late and are happy to come up on these higher angles, feeling it's fast. But we've seen whoever does that gets punished quite hard. So you can see how early the other teams have jibed in. Yes, it's a nice, comfortable lead, and so that's not going to affect it. But we've seen that time and time again on the previous leg coming into the gate, and that's where people are slipping up. And it looks like they're all being fairly docile with each other coming into the, the finish for the next few boats. The Danes jibing away, forced to jibe away. I was surprised the Danes jibed where they did earlier. I, I feel like the Danes have really made a hash of this and um, they should have been attacking the Italians. Instead, they find themselves trying to defend third place from Cape Crow Yacht Club. And it looks like the Danes are just going to hold on to third place ahead of Cape Crow in fourth. Um, so no real harm done, uh, but the women really did make life harder for themselves than they needed to in the closing stages of that race. So a very, very good race win for WSV Giesbeek. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how things are playing out for them when we look at the leaderboard a little bit later on um, and, and see how the Dutch are doing after a race win. And... Uh, one that probably Hemmerlingen should have won, um, but I think they ended up fifth in that race. So uh, a bit of a giveaway by the Germans in that race who should have been able to, if not hang on to that race, win at least get a top three out of it. So that's the end of Flight 17. And uh, it would be good to see the leaderboard. This is going to be a true representation now that everyone has completed Flight 17. So, Corky, uh, talk us through the implications with just one race to go for everybody. Well, again, so you can see the four-point gap at the top. Well, actually, it'll be a five-point gap because, obviously, once uh, even if they score that next sort of uh, point in that next race, that will change up. But we can see they will race the Italians there at the top, Circolo della Vela Bari. They are in the second race of the next flight so it won't be over until sort of that point and depending on how they finish up people that could still change it up of course are the french club de voile saint alban elbeuf and your club brigands neck and neck on points and the points aren't big enough that we could see all of that podium positions change over these next few but so those, those top three are locked in it's just a matter of what order that they finish in now so exactly that. so i mean that in some sense takes the pressure off because you know you're going to be standing on the podium. It's, it's now a matter of which step of that podium are you going to take. And um, then the other battle, that is the qualification getting into that 14th spot. And uh, as we see, uh, WSV Hiesbeck in 16th, that race win, keeping them still in nipping distance of that 14th spot. So they're three points off that 14th spot, but still... Anything can happen. And you look up to Cape uh, Crow Yacht Club. They had that fourth in that final one, 71 points. So still not 100% clear from that, uh, that opportunity of being bumped into that relegation zone. No, but it just goes to show how critical that race win was for the Dutch just then. Um, if they can get another race win in the final race, then that could well see them through to one of those uh, finals spots in Samaritz later on this summer. So, with just one flight to go, um, people have got to keep their game faces on. Um, we're on board with um, the Swiss team. Uh, I think it's Regatta Club. I'm not going to call it, actually, because I can't see what the flag is. <laughs> um, it's one of the Swiss teams. Um, let's hear from Marcus Bauer again and uh, hear about boat speed. It's, it's one of the critical elements of being able to succeed, even though these boats are one design. It's, it's how you get the best out of the boat that you're given that is 
part of the key to doing well in these races. Sailors win with better tactics or with better boat speed. Ideally you have both, but boat speed is a more controllable part. So what makes a boat go fast? There are three things that are crucial. Maximizing drive, minimizing drag, and doing what birds do. Let's go through them one by one. Sailors try to maximize drive by constantly reshaping their sails. They do that by pulling various strings, which is similar to tuning an instrument. Just like a well-tuned instrument sounds right, a well-tuned boat creates the maximum drive forward. Secondly, sailors also try to minimize drag. For example, by polishing the surface of their hulls, keeping them super clean, or by avoiding loose clothing that creates a lot of windage. The third way to go faster is to flap the sails like a bird flaps its wings. A boat is really just like a bird, except that only one wing sticks in the air and the other one dips in the water. But when sailors and windsurfers flap their sails, they use the same aerodynamic effects that make birds take off. Sailors know various techniques with different names like pumping, rocking or ooching. But they all come down to the same principle, propelling the boat through muscle power. But some of these techniques are illegal and sailors need to be very careful not to overdo the bird-like flapping. Else they can get penalized or even disqualified because judges keep a close eye on what's legal and what is not. But remember, a sailor has to do all of that while plotting the optimal course through shifting winds and currents. That's what makes sailing so difficult. Every morning, uh, there's a race briefing for the sailors here at the Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. And one of the topics that frequently comes up from the chief umpire is what form of kinetics is permitted on board the J-70. In other words, when you're going through a, a tack or a jibe and um, you want to roll the boat from side to side to, uh, to generate power through the sails, what are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? So you're, you're not allowed to hang off the shrouds. Um, but you are allowed to hold on to the, to the hatch in the center of the boat and, um, and basically use as much of your body weight as you can to, to swing the rig through an arc, through the, uh, through the maneuver, which is why you see the boats being rolled around as aggressively as you do, especially in these lighter winds. It's, it's a crucial skill and it rewards good crew work um, in terms of being able to uh, keep the speed on and, and sometimes even accelerate the boat out of a maneuver. Uh, we heard the uh, signal for two minutes to go to race one of flight 18, which is the final and concluding flight of this semi-final, the first of two semi-finals of the Sailing Champions League. The second semi-final uh, comes up later this summer in St. Petersburg, Russia. And then the big showdown in Samaritz, Switzerland uh, at the end of August, uh, which is going to be up in the mountains, flat water sailing. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, we see the lump here from time to time and, and the chop actually has an effect on the, on the racing here from time to time. So that's, uh, that's slightly different to what they'll experience in Samaritz. We're on board with uh, the Swiss team at the moment with just one minute 10 to go. And interesting in this race of this final flight, some of the teams are uh, looking to try and get themselves in for that qualification space. Those are the battle. This isn't the, any uh, of those top three teams that are due to battle it out for those podium places that we know are already, already secure. But what order, we don't know. But this race, we have many of the contenders looking for that qualification space. So very important for many of the teams out in the water now. Breeze still round towards that left-hand side, starting to stabilise a little bit more. We've still got about eight and a half to nine and a half knots. 30 seconds to go. People starting to trickle down towards this pin end. Look early. Boat number seven, very high up on this line and not a lot of breathing space. I would have stayed there over at the moment. 
I'd agree with that. And um, will they be able to get over the top of boat number two and, and hold on to this? There's 10 seconds of time to burn off. And RS280, that boat number seven, is going to have to jibe round and start on port tack underneath the fleet. And very, very close on the line for some of the others. But it looks like it's going to be a good start for boat number six, Regatta Club Oberhofen from Switzerland, getting a very good start off the pin end. But some horrible sloppy starts for boats number two and three, um, which are uh, Yacht Club Schreveningen um, in boat number two, and it's Societa Canottieri Garda Salo, who sailed so well in um, the previous race, but uh, have also had a bit of a sloppy start, now find themselves forced to go out on port tack. Four going out at the bottom of our screen on starboard tack, out to the favoured left-hand side, four being forced out to the right-hand side where there's tended to be less breeze. So provided that boat number six can safely tack across the front of the other boats going out to the same side of the course, it's looking very good for Alan Stettler and Regatta Club Oberhofen that we see here. And a great shot. The yellow T-shirts in the background of uh, Cape Crow Yacht Club, they were a couple of boats up and just on the hip, obviously a little bit further back, but there we see rolling over the top, now taking that tap out slightly earlier they are obviously looking for the best possible result they can get to give them every opportunity of getting themselves into that uh, top 14 qualification spaces so a great start nice place to tack out we can see uh, boat number one that's just tacked off behind them floundering a little bit because they were really closed out so a good position to take that tack out early the question will be how they uh, stack up as they come back in towards this top mile. We'll see this boat go for attack soon. There we go. Regatta Club Obenhofen taking that tack now. The crew up onto that side. Legs over the other. Power comes back down. Nine knots of breeze up on this left side. They carried on a lot longer than they needed to, did Regatta Club Oberhof, and they really, really like this left-hand side. So they've really put all their eggs in one basket. And now the question for Alan Stettler and his crew is, was it really worth sailing all that way over to the left-hand side? Well, based on the history of what we've seen so far today, I would say yes. I would say it's probably a risk worth taking. Um, but uh, tactically, it's left them a little bit exposed uh, being so far out to the left of the fleet. Yeah, as you say, it's, um, it's not really sort of it's a commanding position, but you would have, from a tactical side of things, it's gone slightly earlier and just shadowed that fleet across. It gives, means that you're probably slightly closer to the fleet and the actual gain isn't as big, but you're in a commanding, controlling position. And that's what it's all about in these races, is uh, controlling that. But we have seen that left-hand side being so dominant, and that's exactly what we're seeing now. That breeze starting to move back towards that left-hand side, and so the advantage going to Red Gadda Club Oberhofen. So even though they've taken that step away tactically and not been in that sort of closer situation, they've got a nice bit of breathing space and are in control here. So maybe the biggest threat to them um, is the boat on the far side of the picture, Societa Canottieri Garda Salo, the Italians who decided to go out to the right-hand side of the race course. Will they be able to get anything out of the right-hand side? We've seen it happen occasionally, um, and the Italians look like they're doing okay, but I think it's going to be the Swiss uh, that will lead round this Wimbledon mark after securing that pin-end start that seems to be so crucial to success today currently where Cape Crow Yacht Club are which are nearest in picture boat number eight with those bright yellow tops they need this uh, good race if they can stay in uh, the top four positions that's holding them into 12th 13th spot which is just on that inside of that 14th qualification spot so they need that but these boats coming in from the right hand side will look like uh, they're closing the gap and that could add up some points so let's see ah oh, this is the final race this is where tension's running high how many people are going to punch through and try and get into these gaps that might not exist so here we see those boats go in nice comfortable attack for cape crow yacht club but the other two big bailouts behind from the other two teams we're on board with uh, the garda team who have just gone round in second place and being followed round by the Finns uh, representing Olanska, Segal, Salska, Pet and Cape Crow Yacht Club going round in fourth place. Followed by the Danes, Hellerup Sail Club, RS280, 
next around and bringing up the rear is the uh, Swiss team Regatta Club Budensee and then at the back well it is at the yeah, it's Regatta Club Bodensee and Yacht Club Schreveningen at the back so there are some good teams at the back there are no dummies in this fleet but for these guys there's a <clears throat> bit of a shame on that start that was where the error started to creep in but not fine for a podium spot of course you're always looking to be in the best position on that uh, on that leaderboard but can breathe easy knowing that they have qualified they will be going through to the final and so in that sense be a bit frustrated plenty of learning to go away from and do a bit of a jive out there from rs280 but uh we can see that actually in terms they'll all be quite relaxed because they're sitting in on the leaderboard in and around we can see we pick up Regatta Club Bodensee in bad fifth spot. So they are still holding on into the top five. And uh, Regatta Club Oberhofen in around seventh. So two good results. Solid uh, qualification spots. Uh, but uh, a little bit disappointed to uh, finish on the final race with uh, where they are currently. Simultaneous drives by the two front runners, the Swiss and the Italians. Good enough drive by Regatta Club Oberhofen to be able to be comfortably in the lead. Now, um, we've seen a lot of place changing at the bottom mark, and a lot of it seems to be down to a lack of preparation and, and maybe leaving things a little bit too late. Um, these boats are comfortably far enough ahead that we shouldn't see those kind of errors. But, but the other thing is you want to go around the left-hand side, but in order to do so, you've almost got to do a 180-degree handbrake turn, which really scrubs off a lot of the speed on these boats as well so it's it's quite an expensive maneuver in terms of how much speed you lose yeah very much so as say sort of if you imagine it's just exactly how you said a handbrake turn you're turning the boat through such direction and also the sail trim's got to be the same but a very nice comfortable rounding from the guys there kite down all settled crew members just sorting those final bits out but a great rounding from regatta club obenhofen and a very risky, I would say, rounding for Sochia Tokanotieri Gardasolo going round the right-hand side to the unfavoured right-hand side. They didn't do too badly. We're on board with them now. We didn't do too badly um, uh, going out this side on the first beat. So maybe they think the right is not as bad as I think it is. But I think tactically that leaves them quite exposed. And I would worry for the Italians. It's a very bad rounding there for, for boat number one. Uh, which was Hellerup Sail Club. So a bit of a giveaway there and an opportunity for Cape Crow Yacht Club to sail up the inside of them, which is indeed what they've done. So um, poor sailing there by the Danes, handing a spot to Cape Crow Yacht Club. And what a gap there is uh, up to Orlanska Sagel Salskapet in the, the green uh, number four and Regatta Club Oberhofen that we can't see. Uh, still leading this race very comfortably. Cape Club Pro Yacht Club tack away. And there we see our regatta leaders. And it, the, the, the safe covering move would be for the Swiss to tack. But no, they, uh, the Swiss think the, the greater threat is in tacking away early and not making the most of the power of the left-hand side. So we've got the Swiss gambling on the left and we've got the Italians Gambling on the right. Well, I'm going to put my money on the roulette table with the Swiss. I think the Italians are taking the greater risk right now. Yeah, very much so. This breeze over towards this left-hand side, staying in track. You know, we've certainly not seen anything of any significance come from that right-hand side. Yes, they've got clear air, bit of breeze. But actually, you know, all they're doing is putting that risk in the table. Certainly where we look from where to finish the Lanskas coming in, in they're tucked in in third place at the moment, but in a quite comfortable place and coming in from that left-hand side, if they have a comfortable breeze, we'll close that gap on them. So, yeah, rightly so, risk further towards that right-hand side. Breeze to this left still, going slightly softer. We're down into the lower sort of sections of eight knots. Yeah, Nothing radically, really but otherwise all looking pretty good. So it's, it's not going terribly when you look at the, uh, the numbers um, on the meter count. Uh, the Italians not doing at all badly. And we can just see them in shot there. 
Um, so just to the going in and out of picture on the left-hand side, why are they all pointing their hands out? What are they pointing at there, Corky? They're just working their core, aren't they? Is there... Oh, no. They're, uh, as they say, providing that little bit of extra leverage. You're trying to get any part of your body weight over the side of that within the ruling that uh, you're capable of doing. And so an arm, a leg, anything that you can extend out and create that greater leverage is going to be able to harness a bit more power from that boat. And that's exactly what they're doing as they come across from the left-hand side. So now we see that uh, numbers jump a little bit more. You know, there is a nice, comfortable gap for these guys. They will tack in on where this mark is. They've got a little bit further to go. I'd say the Italians have gone quite low underneath this, so you'll see them continue past. That's exactly where they are there because they're not up onto the ley line. They've got a little bit of distance to come back. So the Italians have been quite clever here. And the last thing they want to do is they've gone onto that ley line and found themselves coming back across with the lead boats tacking straight on top of them. So at least this means they've broken cover. They've returned back on port. They've got that clear space. It adds that additional tack and maneuver in, but it means that they've still got clear air and they've not just been sat in dirty air. So Regatta Club Oberhofen, they extend their lead, quite a comfortable lead around the top mark for the final time for the Swiss. The Italians, we're on board with them now. They took that risk, went to the right-hand side all by themselves, as they did on the previous beat, and it's held for them. Uh, they've, they've held on to second place, so not as risky as I thought it was going to be. And Olanska Segal Salskapet holding on to third place with a nice gap uh, going back to the rest of the pack. So it looks like the top three in this race are locked in right now. Um, a bit of a drop back for, for Cape Crow. And um, boat number one that made a bit of a hash of that, lured Mark rounding, have made amends with a very good beat. And the Danes uh, back up into fourth place and quite comfortably ahead of the boat that rolled over the top of them just a few minutes ago. Cape Crow in boat number eight, who are now find that uh, they're being threatened by boat number two, Yacht Club Scheveningen, who uh, really did a very hard turn around that mark, trying to attack the inside of Cape Crow Yacht Club, um, but not succeeding in doing so. Well, looking at that leaderboard as well with where uh, Cape Crow Yacht Club are, we were saying that they are right on that boundary of uh, that 14th qualification spot. They are in 13th at the moment. The points will be very tight, but if they finish there, then obviously that will give them that qualification spot. They will be in there because the other boats around them are still to race and would just pick up some more points. So we could see them in that 12th or 13th spot of qualification, which uh, I think they'll breathe a, a bit of a sigh of relief. And I think the one get-out-of-jail card for them has been that race win that we saw them today, and that has given them that option of qualification. Regatta Club Oberhofen have already jibed off there on the right of our picture. They look pretty comfortable for the lead. Olanska in third place, the Green Jenica, has jibed earlier than the Italians. So that, that's an attacking move there by Finland. Will it be sufficient to overhaul the Italians who we see jibing now? And I suspect the Italians will hold on to second place. Uh, but the Finns really just throwing that last attacking move at the Ita Italians. But... Uh, the, the green sails looking a bit soft compared with the yellow sails of Italy, who, if anything, are making inroads back in towards the leaders. They can see the crew up forward on that boat, doing everything possible to keep that momentum high, weight forward. And they really, you can see the level of detail and concentration they're putting into crew movement. The, the guy on the fore deck just occasionally hiking out, working out his stomach muscles just to put a little bit of extra windward heel on the boat. So uh, really, really high levels of detail. But it's not going to be enough to overhaul Regatta Club Oberhofen, who win their final race of the competition. A very solid win for Alan Stettler, who applauds the race committee and then high fives with his crew. Nice way for the Swiss to finish their regatta and a very solid second place for Italy from the team from Lake Garda at the other end of the country um, in the north of Italy. And then from way up north from Finland, Olanska Segel Salskapet getting third place and the Danes from Hellerup Sail Club managing to hold on to fourth place 
ahead of Cape Crow Yacht Club, who come in fifth, somewhere ahead of Yacht Club Scheveningen, who looked like they were going to attack for that fifth place. But in the end, the, uh, the red number two um, is a few boat lengths behind. Regatta Club Bodensee, the pink sails coming in for seventh ahead of Slovenia's, sorry, Lithuania's uh, RS-280 coming across the line in eighth place. So the frantic turnaround for the next flight. <clears throat> Already teams on and off the boats, ready to go. So in this flight, we do have the current leaders. The Italians. That's the one, Socolo della Vallabari. They are top of the table with a bit of breathing space, but again, will require them to have a good race to keep themselves firmly at the top, so we could see them take the victory in this flight. And in fact, the, uh, the boat in second place overall is also in this flight, so um, it's going to be critical for Club de Voile Santo Ban El Berf to be able to put some boats between them and the Italians. Um, let's take a look at that leaderboard now. Um, so those boats, Corky, numbers one and two, we're about to see go head-to-head -head in this next flight. Well, that's it. So we see that four-point gap as they go into this flight, and that's what the French Club de Voile saint Alban el Boeuf are trying to close to take that first place, but they will be in the same race. So it's going to be very, very tough to claw those points back. But again, we have seen mistakes come in very easily, misjudging the starts. And that's where we're going to see this all pan out. But this race will more than likely decide who will be going home with that top spot. And it's for the Italians all to lose at the moment. Well, we're going to get an interview shortly with Cape Crow Yacht Club. Let's just have a look where they are on the leaderboard because it would be nice to know um, how the Swedes are doing and, and if they've done enough. Well, as things stand, just remind us, Corky, you just went through this, but... Um, uh, is it right to say now that Cape Crow Yacht Club have definitely finished inside the top 14? Well, that's it. So if you look at all of it, because there's no discards or anything to come in, the blank spaces around them are the boats that haven't raced. So APCC Nance are one point in front but still need to race. So you could even see Cape Crow Yacht Club go up another point, um, another place, depending on where the uh, French team finished there. But they are inside that magic 14 number Obviously, we have uh, Borlandische uh, Yacht Club, the Austrian team there, right on that 14th spot, but with only one point away from the Dutch team, WSV Hiesbeck, and one point behind them, Yacht Club at Schiveningen. They are the ones all still to play for to uh, see who is going to take those final couple of spots. Well, let's see if we can go out to Cape Crow Yacht Club on the water. Uh, this is Andy Rice from the commentary team speaking. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And who am I speaking to? Uh, I'm Jakob Lundqvist. I've been the helming for Cape Crow, Crow Yacht Club this uh, weekend. Jakob, uh, very well done today. You've had a series of four... Uh, fourths, fifths and sixes, but you did win a race earlier today and to me it looks like that race victory was what you needed to do to secure one of the top 14 places to go through to San Moritz. Yeah, that was what, exactly what we thought as well, so we were very happy we managed to pull it through and uh, I made a clear start, that's what we, uh, we've been struggling with all the weekend, so I was very happy to that. Uh, since we've been sailing relatively well, except for the starts. So once we yeah, made that clear, uh, it, yeah, we, it was a much easier race. Well, you, you had a pretty nice start, um, but what also fell nicely for you was what some of the other people aiming for the pin end really made a bit of a mess of it, and that, that left the way clear for you in that race, didn't it? Yeah, exactly, and we had actually been... Uh, um, looking at the ley line before, and I said directly, they are too too low down, so they they won't make it. So 
we just uh, stayed cool and kept high uh, to give us self a lot of um, yeah uh, accelerating space uh, and then sail through the race it was the easiest race we have sailed so far so <laughs> That's often the way, isn't it? The races that you win often feel like the easiest, and you wonder why you can't do it race after race. But clearly there's a lot of inconsistency out there, and, and no one is, is able to dominate these races. Um, what, what do you think is the key to securing um, those top three or four places in each race that you do? Yeah, it's, it's the start and, and a clear line. You, do, you want to tack as few times as possible uh, because the breeze is... is um, uh, it's it's so light, especially when it's so hot. It's very hard to to accelerate the boat again. So, so you really want to be uh, out on the um, yeah, either right uh, right side or left side with good pressure. That's all you're aiming for. And knowing what you know now after four days of hard racing, if you were to come back into this competition again and everyone else was starting on day one, how do you think you could do now? In other words, I'm asking, how much better as a team are you today than you were four days ago? I'm hoping that we could make it within top 10 or uh, as a team right now. I'm, uh, I think I'm the weak spot. I, yeah. Everyone starts. Oh, well, that, that's very um, honest of you to say so. I'm sure it's not quite as straightforward mm -hmm. as that. But, Jacob, anyway, mission accomplished. Uh, you've lived to fight another day, yeah. and that other day will come in San Moritz later on this summer. So congratulations on making that. Yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your time in Portachievo. No, no, definitely not. It was fantastic coming here. So thanks a lot for letting us come. Thanks, Jacob, and congratulations to you and the rest of the crew. And we're back into the pre-start for race two of flight 18, this final flight in Porto Cervo. And Corky, you've been keeping an eye on the breeze, and it's, it's been a critical thing to keep an eye on today. What's it up to? Well, we started to see it creep round towards that right a little bit more again. So we're starting to get a bit more swings in that breeze. We can see as we look up the race course and that land and the uh, islands just up in front, they're the things that are causing this breeze just to swirl around. As the wind's coming round that, it's just bending off those bits and causing this uh, wind to be a little bit more shifty than we saw on the previous days. Uh, we're seeing breeze flick round to about 120, 121 degrees, and uh, that's about as far right as it tends to go. But then it's creeping back towards the left-hand side. So at the moment, in that right-hand phase, a little bit of a skewed start, bit of a port end bias again. And so we're seeing boats attack from that port approach, tack in, but we are seeing these lead boats still coming from that mid to left hand side of the race course. At the moment, uh, the Norwegians in the dark blue boat, number one, Moss Salferening, look like they're going to secure the pin end start. And um, quite a late start by some of them. The Norwegians have the space to just go down and accelerate. And good start for them. Good start also for boat number four, which is the boat uh, that we're all watching, Circolo della Villa Bari, a very solid start for the Italians that are leading this race. Uh, but what's going on at the back? The French uh, team that we were looking eyes on as well, Club de Voile, Saint-Aubain, Elbeuf, taking a duck down, jibing round, and they're in all sorts of bother at the back, and they're on that line. They've only just crossed that start line now, and on port. So that has handed all the advantage to the Italians in boat number four here. Della Velabari looking just to secure this top spot. And if then how the current race sits at the moment, they're doing a great job. They're in command here. Got a clear lane, good, good breeze. This is what they're after for this final race of this regatta for them. So for us neutrals, that's an unfortunate state of affairs to see the French uh, do so poorly off the start line. The French really needed to nail that start to be able to take the fight to the Italians. But at the moment, it's being gifted to the Italians. And uh, at the moment, I would say that it's uh, the Norwegians uh, from Moss Salferening that we have in picture now that are in the strongest position based on how strongly the left has paid in most of those races. Well, just as you were saying that, that breeze did flick sort of over that last bit while they were in shot. I was, was wondering, it looked like they were low on this port angle, certainly when we were uh, with Circolo della Velavari 
They uh, looked like they were sailing a lot lower angle, but they've managed to uh, identify that. The breeze now starting to track back towards the left, but we are seeing this right flick a little bit harder. We're at 129 now over towards the right, which is the biggest number we've seen towards the right. So the right is flicking back and coming back harder, but again, it is very short little stint. So you can make a short game, but on a long-term uh, section of the race course. So for these guys, that's where we're at. Also, another boat to keep an eye on is WSV Hizbeck. They are the ones trying to uh, get themselves into a qualification uh, spot as well. And so wherever they place, it's going to be critical to whether they can get into that spot at the moment. They're uh, in about fourth spot, which would see them in around 16th, 17th spot. So just on the, uh, on the cutoff. So WSV Hizbeck won their previous race in the flight that we saw earlier today. They really need to get another race win if they're going to be able to secure a spot in the final in San Maritz. The Norwegians rolling onto starboard tack. Moss Salferaining still not on ley line, so uh, maybe looking for a bit more breeze out on this side. That sees them sailing even further away from the rest of the fleet. So uh, the Norwegians really gambling hard on the left-hand side of the course and hoping for something good on this side. And they're sailing through some powerboat wash in order to achieve that. Question now is, when Norway tacks back, will they have enough distance to be able to sail across the top of all those starboard tackers because the Norwegians will be in the tactically disadvantaged position. They will have to give way to any boats that they're on a collision course with. And likewise, APCC Nuns, they are right on that borderline as well of qualification. So we've got two major battles going on. So a lot for the Dutch and the French to think about in terms of whether they secure a spot from the semi-final here to go through to San Maritz. And we've also got those Italians to keep an eye on, Circolo della Velabari, who have sailed such a solid regatta here, coming across on starboard tack. And now, have the Italians got a piece of the Norwegians in the front of our screen, or have the Norwegians done enough to be able to get across the front of Italy and the other boats on starboard tack? It looks like the Norwegians will just squeeze across the front of the Italians. The Italians look like they're luffing up to me. And that's what the Norwegians are saying. The Italians, I think, were gunning for that. I think they were looking for a piece of the Norwegians, and it was a little bit of cheeky sailing by the Italians, who now have a lot to do to go behind the back of those two boats. And uh, Norway, will they get away with that, or will they be given a penalty? A whistle went, and uh, the flag oh, died. Oh, I, I feel a little bit sorry for them. That's harsh. I, I think there was some gamesmanship <laughs> going on there. And the Norwegians have, have come off worse. And uh, easy for us to say with our overhead view. Um, but I think the Italians changed course. Yeah, I agree totally. Sort of the Italians there, you could see them just start to squeeze. It all looked comfortable for the Norwegians. It was going to be close, but there was a clear sort of uh, cross. And then they slowly started to squeeze it up and squeeze it up in those final bits. To hit that whistle and it not be a green or white flag, I felt was uh, pretty harsh on the Norwegians then. They, you know, they also, from when we switched to the onboard camera, were putting their arms up and, and, and pretty clear that they uh, felt hard done by by what had happened there. And I think um, the umpires, uh, when reviewing this a little bit later, might feel that uh, uh, they might have been a, a touch harsh with that. But that's what's so, you know, we can see that from a nice drone shot. But when you're on the water, to actually identify that exact angle is pretty tricky. But, um, yeah, certainly uh, the, the slide of cards has gone to the Italians. Well, if there's any consolation for anyone, it's the APCC Nantes from France have now profited from those shenanigans, and that moves them into the lead of this race. And, Corky, you will update us on how that leaves the French overall in terms of have they done enough as things stand to secure one of the top 14 places? At the moment, they are in 13th, but there would be one point separating them from the 14th place boat. So they haven't raced yet. So at the moment, they have got a bit of breathing space, but if they slip back in this race, then they still could be on that uh, cutoff line. But at the moment, they are securing their position in their current situation. 
So APCC Nantes on the right of our screen, now being followed by the green kite of the Italians jibing and Norway still coming down on starboard jibe. Um, we're, I think we were looking at the Italians there briefly. Um, so the two leaders going out to the right of our picture and then third and fourth place still fighting it out, um, soaking low on starboard jibe. So this is quite an early jibe out by the, uh, the top two boats, and we don't see this happening very often today. Oh, but now you can see why. So, so actually, they, they jibed in a fairly conservative spot. The two boats on the left of picture have left it really extremely late indeed, and the wheels are really falling off for the Norwegians. I feel so sorry for them. They're the dark blue boats on the left-hand side, and, and from just leading this race, going up the first beat... Um, it looks like they're going to be going round this mark at best in fourth place. It could even be worse than that. So APCC Nantes dropping their kite on the right-hand side of the picture, going out to the right-hand side of the course. And that's who we're on board with now. Um, so the French aiming to hold on to this lead, but sailing on what we've tended to see as the less favoured side. And, oh, it's getting even worse for Norway. They've had to drop their kite early. Um, and they're now barely holding on to fourth place. Um, they are in danger of falling back to, it looks like, fifth now. So uh, just a, a horrible, horrible race that was not entirely of their own making. Um, but hard to keep your cool when, when things have gone bad. And uh, is there going to be a penalty come out of any of this? Or there's a trawl for boat number eight. They've got their spinnaker in the water. So Catching um, fish. Boat number eight, um, which is... Uh, Club de Voile, Voile Centre Ban. Oh Burr. no! So it's uh, oh all kinds of disaster for the boat that really needed to get a good score if it was going to have any chance of taking the fight to the Italians. But it's just gone terribly for the French. It's gone terribly for the Norwegians, and it's a, a catalogue of errors. And is that a penalty for the Norwegians? It looks like it is. And, and how quickly things can change. I just wonder if, after feeling like they were hard done by by the Italians and taking a penalty at the top of the course, have the Norwegians lost their composure? Well, that's it. It's sort of, it's so easy to, when a penalty kicks in, to be so frustrated, angry about why. In a way, you just have to get it done. It's not the time to analyse what happened, how it was done. It's the time of, right, let's execute a good penalty turn. Let's get straight back in. And how do we get a catch back up? But very interesting to see all things uh, falling off from the Norwegians, but also from a team that we've uh, watched throughout the week, sort of a uh, club de voile, centre ban, birth. This today's just been all over the place for them. And they've uh, really struggled and see this final race all starting to fall apart. The only club um, that can really dictate sort of where they're going to finish on the podium is Yacht Club Brigens, and certainly with uh, what the French are doing at the moment, are giving them a nice, comfortable spot. Uh, but so far, it is complete control for the Italians, for Circolo della Velabari. Even though we felt they might have been a little bit cheeky at that top mark and, uh, and forcing that uh, penalty... They are in a comfortable spot in this race, and that's all they need with the points gap that they've got. If they currently say where they are in the standings, they cross that line, they will win the semi-finals here in Porto Cheva. So the place changing between the top two right now, Italy has a sniff of being able to actually take the lead in this race. Uh, will the French from APCC Nantes be able to hold on? APCC have not been one of the front runners in this competition, so they're sailing an incredibly good race by their standards. Will they be able to hold off the Italians who have sailed so brilliantly across these four days? It's looking like the green sail of the Italians is moving ahead of the French, so uh, things just seem to be getting better and better for Simone Ferraresi and the crew of Circolo della Vela Bari. And they are giving bad gas now. They're giving gas to the French. The French took the right-hand side of the race course, which has tended to be the weaker side to sail, and the French have paid the price, now having to yield first place to the Italians. So the Italians looking set to finish their regatta in the best way possible, 
Um, increasingly, it looks like we're looking at the regatta winners just bearing away for the final time here in Portocevo. APCC not going round in second place, and that's where we're on board with now. Will they be able to get back first place down this final run? And a shoot for the windward mark by the Germans, the Segel on Motorsport Club Überlingen, and they have just managed to get round in third place. So Timo Mittelmeier and his crew just holding on to third, having to shoot the breeze, followed by... Oh, what are we seeing here? We're on the left-hand side of picture. There's, there's a luff going on, and a club... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Club de Bois, Santo Van Elberf, luffing the other boat and being aggressive all the way to the finish. But it's, it's, it's really not going to help um, in the overall scheme of things. But it just goes to show just how much they're fa fighting for, for every position on this race course. It's, uh, it's the two boats that have really just had an awful race. Um, <laughs> and uh, taking out their frustrations on each other. Most sail for reigning, who were leading this race earlier in the early stages, being luffed there by Club de Voile Santo Ban El Berf, who have seen their hopes of winning this regatta go down the tube in this particular race. But then knees lead to boat. <clears throat> this is what it's all about. The green spinnaker here, Circolo della Velabari, currently leading this final race for themselves and will be the ones that as they cross the line will take the win here. And the boat just back from them right on board now is APCC Nantes, which are fighting for their qualification position and with their current position will hold them in a qualification position. They are in 14th, bang on it with equal points, but uh, that is with Borg Landis, she's the uh, yacht club, which still need to race in the next uh, next race of the final flight, which will see them gain that extra point and move them up to 13th. So a great race when the pressure's been applied and everything comes down to it. These two teams have performed in the way they need to. But look at the advantage from the green spinnaker. It's you pretty shout. significant, isn't it? Um, so APCC Nantes, uh, at best, it looks like they're going to get second place. It does look like second is fairly secure for them. But uh, Chocolo della Velabari just meters away from crossing the finish line, which will be sufficient for them. Are you sure about this, Corky? 100%. They <laughs> okay. will be three <laughs> points clear, and it still needs Yacht Club uh, Brigance uh, to race. And so even if they won that race, it would leave them with a four-point lead. Thank so you very this much, This is guaranteed. Here they are. And there are the winners, Cercolo della Velabari, winning on home waters. Congratulations to Simone Ferraresi, Valerio Galati, Corrado Capecci, Minutolo, and Leonardo Dinelli. And uh, none of them are bothered about getting the Jenica down. <laughs> They're too busy celebrating. The French APCC Nantes crossing second, a, a, a few slaps on the back. Still a good race for them. Shame for the French that they couldn't hold on to the win, but uh, still a Enough good for way qualification. for them to They needed that for the uh, qualification spot, so they might not know the numbers as, they, as we do now. But that is good enough for them to qualify and they will be joining us at that final. Well, congratulations to Nantes for doing enough in the final race and achieving that in that case. And that is Uberlingen in third place and WSV Heesbeck crossing in fourth place, the uh, boat number two, the Red Sail. And is that the Norwegians that we see going across boat number one. I think it might be. And I feel desperately sorry for them in that race. I, they, they were leading after such a good start and a good first beat. But there's some luffing action. And in amongst that luffing action, Club de Voile, Santo Ban, El Berf, aggressive all the way to the finish. Who will get round in first? I can't call that one. It's a matter of who Spinnaker managed to flutter across that finish line before the other. Um, but what a sad finish for Club de Voile Santo Ban El Berf, who must have had some hope of being able to 
uh, win this regatta, uh, but faded in the dying stages. Uh, so we hope at some point that we will be able to get an interview with the winners from Italy. Um, and meanwhile, we still have the, uh, the final flight to go. So should we just have a look at the leaderboard and see how things are looking with just the, the final race to go? So that's as things stand with just one race left of the final flight. Corky, what are the implications that we need to be looking at? Well, so again, for second and third place, that's, uh, there's a big enough gap now that um, for Yacht Club Bregenz, it's all for them to lose. But of course, they cannot take the win. That is all being wrapped up by a superb performance in a final race. But of course, throughout this whole few days of racing from the Italian Circuit della Velabari, they've uh, done a, an amazing job. But uh, let's whiz down to the qualification uh, battle um, because that is where it's still all to play for. The podium spots are sorted. So we're going to go down to the place is that matter. So there we can see uh, APCC Nons with that second, leaving them in 14th spot, but with 77 points. But you can see the gap above them on equal points, the Burlandish Yacht Club with 77 points, but they haven't raced. So even if they won that race, it would be one extra point that would slide them to 14 and Nance would be in. But still for them to possibly lose it, if they didn't have a great race, it could see Yacht Club at Schieveningen make that uh, jump on it. So some still fairly tight, but that is where this battle goes. Uh, is going to carry on so, into so this, this final race. Just keeping that on screen a little bit longer, Bergen Lenders for Yacht Club basically need to sail a blinder in this final race if they're going to stay in the top 14, right? Exactly, so, Dan. So they need to finish in the top two of this final race. Is that correct? That's correct. Ned. So let, let's keep an eye on how the Austrians fare in this final race. They got a second in their last race, which was by far their best score from the last few races. They need a, a similarly stunning score. But here we are with Simone Ferraresi. Congratulations to you and the crew of Ciccolo della Vella Bari. Thank you, yeah. Amazing uh, day today. We started uh, almost on equal points with uh, other two teams and... Uh, it was quite a tough day, and uh, it's amazing to come out with a victory of this event, uh, also for our club, Circo de la Bari. Now, you're not that close to your home waters, but what is it like to, uh, what's it like to win on Italian waters? Yeah, of course, this is even uh, more amazing. I mean, uh, it's uh, fantastic. Uh, Sardinia is uh, wonderful as always, so sunny, good wind, good breeze. Uh, amazing races and uh, yeah we are far from uh, home but uh, we are uh, quite a uh, lot selling here also and uh, yeah we we love the place and event and everything amazing uh, what was the key to your success sailing across so many different races and having to maintain that concentration for so long <laughs> Yeah, that was, uh, of course, tough. Um, also, in the last race, we were uh, exactly against the French that were our uh, opposite, and uh, they tried, of course, to match us a little bit. Uh, we came out with uh, an amazing start. Uh, also, they got a penalty, so the goal was uh, to keep clean and uh, try to put them on the back to make a clean race, and uh, that was it. Uh, uh, coming, of course, with the win uh, also of the last race is uh, fantastic. And, uh, of course, I have to thank uh, to thank uh, Corrado, Leo and uh, Valerio for an amazing job and, uh, of course, my club. And, of course, your crew members will be throwing you in the water at some point because that's what always happens to the winning skipper. Are they strong enough to throw you in? I don't know. I mean, I'm uh, the heavier on the crew, so it will be tough for them. Uh, the rule is uh, if I go in the water, they may also go on the water. <laughs> I, I've just heard from my director, if you can let go of the microphone first, because it's quite expensive. <laughs> of course, we take the care of that. <laughs> Thank uh, you. En enjoy your um, celebrations this evening, Simone, and, and the rest of the team. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So the winning Italians, but we still have other battles to fight. And... Uh, Particularly, we're going to be watching how those Austrians from Borgenlandische Yacht Club fare in this final race. We're on board at the moment with GVK Plateau 25 Association from Lithuania. Um, and they are towards the, the back of the, the leaderboard, but uh, still gaining 
valuable experience from racing in, in every single flight. And uh, Corky, how much, how much tougher do you think it's going to be in the finals compared with the semi-finals of this competition when you see the best of the best? I, I think it's going to get um, pretty brutal, to be honest, with the race. Every single race is going to, to matter in the same way as it has here in the semi-finals. A challenging uh, place to sail, San Moritz, with, uh, again, with the wind coming off from those mountains and, uh, and providing that tricky kind of sailing conditions. But, um, yeah, you're bringing all the best of the teams. And so you might not see some of the teams being so consistent like we have seen with the uh, first, second and third places. You might see a few more dips. And, and that's what's going to be really important. How many of those teams are going to hold that consistency? Are we going to see a few more peaks and troughs from those teams? Um, and that's going to be uh, what's going to be fascinating when it goes to San Moritz. It's, uh, you know, if, if we see someone staying so consistency through and through, then uh, that's exactly what's going to be needed to take that win. So about three minutes to go to the final start of many. This will be race 54 across the four days of competition that we've seen here. It, it is a, a, a brutal schedule. Um, but the race committee have done a fantastic job of getting the races away. And there's some interesting um, uh, sort of innovations that they brought in to keep the races rolling around. We talked about this yesterday, the choice of three windward marks and a flag flying on the committee boat to tell the teams which of those three windward marks they need to be aiming for. And the reason for that is, Corky? Well, again, it's, you know, you're in such a, a location, shorter courses, that any time that course needs to be reshuffled due to the wind moving slightly to the right, to the left, or even if it increases or, or drops, having those options to be able to shorten the course, change that direction without a rib, having to go and move a mark, wait 10 minutes for them to reset and not allow to touch it during the starting sequence then that's exactly where it is. So the choice of three marks is superb. And as soon as that flag goes up, identifies, everyone knows where it's at, and they can just get on and race. Well, I wonder what they're thinking on board the Austrian boat right now, Borg and Lendersher Yacht Club. I wonder if they've done their sums. I would think they probably have, because they've probably been watching from the good ship Matilda, watching our coverage and looking on the SAP sailing analytics to, to see what the state of play is on the leaderboard. So they probably know what they need to do. And th there we see the Austrians with a lot of work to do. They need to finish inside the top two to secure a spot in the finals in San Moritz. So one minute 40 to go. And the other boat uh, to keep an eye on is Yacht Club Brigands. Uh, just remind me, Corky, what's the uh, the points gap? It's, it's they're in a fairly safe spot for securing second overall. So it's, it's so more a matter of not mucking it up, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. At the moment, they go in without their race at the moment, uh, three points behind. But of course, if they score the first, that would uh, give them four point gap. So they're, uh, the best they can finish up is four points clear from first, but they have still got a six uh, point gap over third place. So uh, they're going to have to really... Um, do something quite disastrous in this race to lose that second place. Yeah, okay, so pretty much secure. So I, I think the interest here mainly is on how the Austrians, Borg and Lendersche Yacht Club, managed to do with just 50 seconds to go and quite a line-up at the committee boat end and the boat that's furthest from that end and still to tack on to starboard is boat number two and that's Yacht Club Monaco. And we're on board now with... GVK Plateau 25 Association from Lithuania. And just off to the left of that picture just then, boat number one is Yacht Club Bregenz in second overall. 15 seconds to go. And Yacht Club Monaco looking like they're going to win the pin in boat number two. And then on their shoulder, boat number three is GVK Plateau 25 Association. It looks like it's going to be a clear start. Some good starts by the Lithuanians and the Monaco team who just do a little roll around the pin end, but a very good start by Monaco. And we're on board with Borgen Lendersche Yacht Club, who are the boat that need to finish in the top two if they are to secure one of those coveted spots for the San Moritz finals. 
Well, just hearing a little bit more information, we're just trying to get complete clarification on it. They might need to win this race to do it because the boat that they would end up on equal points with is carrying a first place, and that could be the separator on that. So even if they ended up on equal points, they could end up losing on the count back with that one first place the boat uh, has in place. So we're just getting clarification on that, and we'll update you very shortly. But certainly, they need to be in in it to win it, worst case, sort of second spot, but a second place could and might not be enough. They need first place. Just got confirmation straight there. So they need to win this race here. Well, they've got a lot on if that's the case because Yacht Club Monaco on the nearest to our picture, I think is looking in a very strong position on the left-hand side of the course. And that's a class act that are on this boat representing Monaco. Um, whereas Bogen Lendersher Yacht Club, they're in the middle of the pack. Yes, things could go their way. Um, but we need to see a change of pattern to what the breeze has done. The, the Monaco team that we're looking at now look like they've got a little bit, bit more breeze on this side of the course. Yeah, so we've got uh, across that race course at the moment, still staying fairly consistent around eight and a half knots of breeze. So the breeze actually has been pretty solid with regard to strength. And we've seen eight, eight and a half. It's now trickled up to nine at times, but uh, it's generally half a knot give or take in and there around that. But we have still seen this breeze flicking around. Um, it is still staying in this left phase. Furthest round sort of at the moment, about 119, 118, and then uh, trickling back to sort of 110. So there's still a good seven, eight degrees of, uh, of wind shifts available for these teams to uh, tuck into. Softish breeze at the moment. You can see the boat, the crews aren't fully hiked. Yacht Club Monaco in a secure position sailing across on Port Tack, and the boat that's on the far left now that we can see on screen, GVK, Plateau 25 Association from Lithuania. They had a nice start, and will they be able to come back in and, and get something decent from their left-hand side? Because we've seen other people manage to do it. That's who we're looking at now. Can the Lithuanians jag something from the left-hand side of the course? will be really interesting as well. We, we've been highlighting Borg and Landisha, uh, Yacht Club, the Austrians there, requiring a race win. Funny enough, that's putting a huge amount of pressure coming into your race. And uh, But looking back over a few of their legs um, and their final flights, they've had three seventh places back to back. So the pressure's all stacked up onto this last day, really, for them, sort of in the final sort of uh, play out from yesterday and into the early stages of today. And, and that's where all the pressures ended up requiring them to gain this first place. And that's a, a pretty tough one. You've got a second place boat out there, Yacht Club Brigands. You know, you've got some hard hitters still out on that race course. And for you to uh, go in needing a specific spot is, is a pretty hard challenge. Yes, at this stage, it doesn't look like it's going to happen for the Austrians in the way that they would have liked. At the moment, it looks like Yacht Club Monaco are going to add another race win to the one that they got earlier today. And they have got stronger as the competition has gone along. In the early stages of this competition, they clocked up three OCSs for starting over the line too early. But uh, the Monaco team with some... Olympic representatives for France on board that crew are now up into sixth place overall. So they've just got better and better. And Yacht Club Brigands, second overall in this competition and currently lying second in this race as their blue Jenica goes up. Next row, the next round is the green sails of Malmö Segel Salskapet from Sweden. Followed by Royal Danish Yacht Club, sailed by the only all-female crew here, skippered by Trina Paludan. Next around is Wassersportverein Hemmerlingen from Germany. And where is there they are? Bergen Lendershire Yacht Club. Well, they are at the wrong end of this fleet, I'm afraid, um, in order to be able to secure a spot for Samaritz. It just doesn't look like it's going to happen for the Austrians. No, unfortunately... Uh not a bad start, but then they tacked out slightly earlier towards that right-hand side. A bit of advantage for all those boats coming in from that left, holding that breeze in. But um, just a shame that that's not going to be 
the way it's going to pan out. They've got uh, still plenty of racing to go, but uh, with the current win state and the uh, level of competition up in front of them, they're going to be hard pushed to scoop anything back that will uh, draw them anywhere close to that first spot. Well, the, the only thing that uh, might help them out is that two of their rivals at the back of the fleet have jibed off early and we've not really seen that work for anybody. So I, I think that's clutching at straws for the Lithuanians and the Germans that have taken that route. So that's maybe two places back uh, for the Austrians, but it's, uh, it's going to be a long way back uh, for the Austrians to have a sniff of overtaking the front four boats, let alone winning the races, uh, race, which is what they needed to do. But here we are, boat, boat number one, the navy blue boat that we see there is Yacht Club Brigands sitting in second place, and that will see them five points uh, just off that first place, but a solid second place. So they've had a, a great regatta. Um, they slipped up a little bit in that last sort of couple of races where they uh, would have wanted to keep those points slightly tighter and give them a, a snapping distance at being able to take the title. But again, this is the semi-final. Yes, you want to go away and win it and stand at the top of that podium. But uh, sitting there in second place, you, uh, you've got to be pretty pleased from that. Take those learnings away and then just come back even stronger in the final. And yes, a very solid set of scores for them. Uh, for Max Tripolt and Mar, who we just saw in picture, Hanno Som and Jodok Kung, who we interviewed earlier um, and got some feedback from Jodok, uh, his admission that... Uh, what went wrong for them in that race was um, was his own steading, uh, treading on the, uh, the sheet at a crucial moment during a jibe and a drop. And I think that's, uh, you know, it, even though it seemed a little bit harsh that he was flagging it out, it shows the actual professionalism of some of the sailors that are involved, you know, to be able to put your hand up and say, look, that was my mistake. That was our. It's it's so easy to kind of sit there and say, "Oh, we didn't do this well and didn't do this." You know, it was a straight up hand up in the air. That was my mistake, and that that's kind of what happened. And so it allows the team to really kind of grow in strength from that, and to have characters on board in such a way. I, I think it's uh, phenomenal, and it shows actually the level of even though this is club racing, the level and caliber of the sailors on board and these clubs that are racing is 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 very high. It is. And uh, when you're sailing together so intensely for so long, um, you've got to have that shared collective responsibility of if things go wrong. It's not just about one person. It's, it's about how you operate as a team. It's how you bounce back as a unit, not about finding a scapegoat on board the boat. So very much like you and me then, sort of. Uh, you <laughs> Anything know. that goes wrong is, <laughs> is your fault, Corky. We've been clear about that since the start. Um, so... It's looking soft here, but uh, Yacht Club de Monaco, they've tacked along with everybody else onto port tack now, still protecting the left-hand side. So Francois Brenac still in a pretty strong position to hold on to the race win here for Monaco. Bottom right, the mini map, just showing where those boats are stacked up. You can still see those lead boats approaching from that mid to left-hand side, and that has just been the dominant place to be over the last couple of days. Coming off that line, securing that little left shift and just coming back in that mid-left position. So you're in the center of the course in that final third of the racetrack. By being there, you're in complete control. You can take that right shift. You can go back towards the left, but you're in a commanding position and allows you to attack or defend. So uh, great tactics from these boats, but uh, a consistently uh, fairly solid strategy that most of the teams have been trying to apply. Yacht Club Brigands sailing pretty quickly in boat number one, the dark blue sail just right of centre. Um, but doesn't look like it's going to be enough to be able to threaten the leaders on the left of our picture, boat number two. And quite processional at the moment, this race. Not many opportunities for the likes of Bergen Lendersher to get back up into the front of this pack. And... Uh, it's going to be agonizingly close to that cutoff point for the Austrians, but it, they're going to fall just the wrong side of it for getting into the finals. And as you said, with that breeze going slightly lighter, we have still sort of tickling up to eight knots, but we are seeing it dropping into six to seven knots, so that softer side of the breeze. So getting into that sort of latter part of the day again, great conditions still for these boats, great conditions and stunning setting. 
for them to uh, perform at the first semi-finals of the same Champions League. Uh, but uh, this breeze will hold on through to the end. But it also shows how challenging it is. The teams having to adapt, change that gear, not be so aggressive, slow down their manoeuvres and with their pace and the movements around. Okay, it's very easy just to go all oh, hell's bells at everything and just try and yank the kite up and be as quick and as aggressive as possible. But it's about speed and momentum and trying to keep these boats just going. Nice, smooth tack, good control of body movement through the boat for Yacht Club Brigands there. Just a good illustration of what Corky was talking about, the, the, uh, the, the deft body movement that you need to make in these kind of conditions, not rock the boat too much. Good ley line call there, sort of that early tack. Yacht Club Brigands just uh, slightly higher on it, allows them to keep a bit of speed, but by shortening that distance, a great hoist as well. That is going to see them extend that little bit of a lead over them. And all looks very comfortable for Yacht Club Monaco at the it front. It does. That really was a, a beautiful hoist, wasn't it? It was just straight up, set, cleared away from their sails. The team was sat down already in position. But they have sailed a slightly higher line to ensure that kites come out. So it uh, does give that Yacht Club Brigands that little bit of that inside line. But there was enough of a gap there. There's no reason why Yacht Club Monaco can soak down a little bit. The all-female crew holding third place at the moment, are just ahead of Malmo. So Denmark just leading Sweden for third and fourth. Germany going round from Hamerlingen in fifth place. And then Borgen Lendersche Yacht Club. We had hopes for them of being able to qualify from this race, but they needed to win it, and that's not going to happen for them. And it's, uh, it's not too bad a hoist. I thought it was going to be a bit of a... Sloppy hoist, but actually we've seen good hoists from, from all of the boats here. Yeah, the actual teamwork and seeing how quick those sets have been. We've seen uh, in previous years when that breeze is a little bit higher, people trying to push really early to get that hoist up and set and uh, being caught out by the odd gust because they are big Jenikas for these boats and uh, take as soon as they load up, they do carry a lot of pressure around with them. Um, so but some really nice teamwork. And considering these teams, yes, they've been in different boats throughout their national leagues. To step into these boats, they, it might be early days of the J70s and they've not done a huge amount. So actually stepping in and being able to uh, just get in and sail so smoothly and be happy with the teamwork, who's doing what in each role, has been really impressive. So, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of good stuff, but we've also seen a lot of stuff where once the pressure mounts, the cracks start to form and some poor, lured, uh, certainly lured gate round and drops with the spinnakers but also again the red mist dropping down on a few people and that sort of hunger to not let points slip and try and go for gaps that maybe don't exist or push the rules that little bit harder and and penalties being applied but certainly today there's uh, been less penalties thrown out than there were yesterday yeah that's true isn't it yeah um so i, I wonder why that is i mean it, it is a little bit more processional today it's been a bit more of a one-sided track so so maybe we've seen uh, less coming together of boats because of that. Um, but yeah, are people getting better behaved as well? I don't know. Oh, not sure <laughs> on that one. I just, just think, as you say, sort of with the uh, breeze being a bit more processional, sort of staying and, and hovering on that left side, it's uh, very easy to uh, just hold on to that side and... Um, and everyone just uh, has to behave themselves. It's just you, the opportunity to attack is uh, is more limited. Yacht Club Monaco just about 100 metres away from the finish line. Yacht Club again still breathing down the neck, um, but it's not going to be enough. This is going to be a nice way for this experienced crew, experienced in terms of their overall sailing experience, first-time participants in the Sailing Champions League. So um, rookies in that sense and uh, a fantastic way for Yacht Club Monaco to finish off its first time entry into the Sailing Champions League as they are now just a few metres away from winning this race. So that's it for Francois Branac, Stéphane Christidis, Jan Rocherio and Thomas de Planck who win that race. Congratulations to them. And there we see the second place boat across this finish line, Yacht Club Bregenz from Austria, also 
second overall and deserved high fives from this crew. Max Tripolt, the skipper, crewed by Anne Mar, Hanno Som and Jodok Kung. Fantastic racing by them. Uh, but it's uh, still a lot going on behind them. Uh, very soft breeze. And any of these next three boats look like they could take third place. Who's it going to be? The, uh, the light blue spinnaker on the left-hand side, the green spinnaker in the middle, or the purple spinnaker at the top of screen. Very, very, very tight sailing coming into the final dying stages. It looks like Can light blue spinnaker could just do it, but will the green on starboard be able to do it? Looks like... Oh, what do you think? Corky. I felt that uh, the Royal Danish Yacht Club, I would have thought, squeezed that, but uh, we'll see. And that's what the analytics have given it. So uh, the Royal Danish Yacht Club, the all-female team, jibing in and securing that on board here with uh, Yacht the Club Yacht Club Brigands after a second place in the final race, but a second overall. Be pretty pleased with that, but some uh, close battles with the breeze, we're seeing down to five knots, and that's why it suddenly went really soft and the boat's all trying to squeeze across that line. So uh, very, very tight battles going on and all the way through to the finish. It certainly uh, hasn't shaken up that leaderboard with that qualification stage with uh, who we were keeping an eye out on for Bull Lancashire uh, Yacht Club, who will end up finishing 16th overall. So that is those two spots clear of the uh, overall cutoff point. A uh, bit of a shame they had all to do by finishing first. You can see there the onboard camera, cameraman uh, just trying to get alongside for a, a little interview with Yacht Club uh, Bregenz. But some superb racing as they go across here. So hopefully we'll be able to talk to one of the crew fairly soon. And Anmar takes over the helm. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, am I speaking to Max? Yes, it's Max. Hi, Max. This is Andy Rice from the commentary crew. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It was a really, really tough day today. Uh, the crews are getting better and better at the fourth day. And uh, yes, what a, was a quite nice racing and uh, difficult because the wind was shifting again and yeah, but we did a did a good job. My crew did a really good job, and uh, we saved the second place now, and uh, take the lead for over the the French guys. Yes, the French guys made a bit of a mess of their final race. You sailed a very solid race to yes. come in second. Um, yeah. Did you have hopes earlier on in the day that you would actually be able to win overall? And and if you did, where do you think it went wrong today? Uh, I don't know. It, he did the mistake in the last race. Uh, we saw it because he was nearly match racing against uh, the Italian crew. Uh, and we saw that he had some, some problems there. Uh, and we, yeah, we had just, uh, yeah, we can just see the positive of, of it. And uh, yeah, haven't made these mistakes, made a, a safe start and uh, bring the safe second place in, in, to the finish line. And uh, how much brain power, concentration have you got left? It must be really, really mentally exhausting out there. Yeah, it's, it, was the, it was the fourth day. Uh, beautiful weather, but also the sunny, sun is uh, killing your brain nearly. And uh, uh, four, four days with heavy racing and really m much racing, 18, 18, fl uh, 18 flights. Uh, it was really tough. And to keep the concentration up uh, was not that not that easy, but I think we did a good job, and uh, yeah, we're really happy now. And you put yourself in a good position for performing performing well in the finals in Samaritz. Uh, will Samaritz <laughs> fit a little bit more like um, sailing at home, um, sailing on a on a lake? Yes. The oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry, I lost the phone. Um, yes, you're right, but uh, I think it would get really, really hard there because the good teams from uh, from St. Petersburg are also coming, so uh, all the other sailors will get better and better. 
and yeah we try to give our best there and uh, yeah we'll have a look what what's possible and try to give the best there well i'm sure your friends at home are delighted with your performance and we congratulate <laughs> you and the crew max a fantastic score okay. by you thank you very thank much thank you thank you thank you for the club and uh, thank you for all the all the helpers here it was a really great event thank you thank you max and yes um, Corky, we should pay tribute to uh, all the, the smooth operation that uh, goes on behind the scenes. I mean, we, we've seen race after race uh, banged off here by Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. They, they run so many world-class competitions, and, and, and that's why the Sailing Champions League has come back here over these past few days for the fourth occasion. Well, exactly that is that no event can be uh, run so smoothly. It's been really quick the in between the races. The sailors haven't had a huge amount of time in between the races. They're straight on and back into the next race or into the next flight. The use of Matilda, the uh, big boat where they're all on the party island to allow them to get that bit of shade, get on food and drink. Um, and again, the support staff and everyone that's been there has been uh, done a superb job. The weather's been great. They've had a nice... Portachevo, perfect conditions that you'd expect. Um, the racing's been superb to complete all 18 flights, and that's 54 races completed um, over the last four days. Um, it's spectacular. So uh, a huge well done to everyone involved. Well, let's have a look at that leaderboard and just remind ourselves of how things ended up. Uh, so, Corky, the, the first three were locked in um, with a flight to go. So we, we knew how things were going to pan out. And uh, the disappointment for me was to see Club de Voile Santo Ban um, attempt the match race with the Italians. I, I guess that was the right thing to do, but it, it really just didn't work out for them. In, in the end, you see, well, it, it, an impressive number of first places by Circolo della Velabari going into the final stages of this regatta. Well, exactly that. It sort of was a... Uh in a way, a little too late, sort of taking the match race to them at that point. Once once these final points are decided, you, you kind of need to, in the same way as you do with chess, is play those points so much earlier on, try and get them to sustain some heavier blows uh, further on in the regatta and hope that it impacts later on. Because once you get to these final few stages um, and final few races, it, it makes it really tricky to try and just secure those additional extra points. And, and they went fair play. They went all out for it. Um, but they were the ones that actually got uh, their fingers burnt from it. Um, a solid performance, as you say, you look from just flight 12 to 18 and six first places uh, for Circolo della Velabari. You know, um, a great performance, uh, worthy winners, um, but a very good battle between all the other fleets um, from there. And again, there was still another battle that went through into the final races, which was the qualification battle. And that's what they were all here for in the semi-finals. Uh, they were trying to get themselves into those top 14 boats. So there was the top 10, and now this is the second page. So those top four boats that have squeezed in. And you can still see how tight the points were. We saw Cape Crow Yacht Club really battling it out for those points, as well as APCC Nance, and those were the secured ones. Again, we saw uh, Borlandisha uh, Yacht Club trying to, uh, again, a little too late. They needed to win that last race if they were to do anything to secure a qualification spot. But again, great racing, very tight racing. You know, 54 races across the whole thing and some superb, some superb racing from all the teams. Let's have a look at the, the, the bottom two. So um, J.K. Aurora bringing up the rear, representing Slovenia. First time participants in the Sailing Champions League. So uh, a big learning curve for them. And GVK Plateau 25 Association from Lithuania. Um, so they will have learned a lot from this experience. A huge amount. And again, it's, uh, you know, from having to go out and race that intensely and back to back, that's uh, a very, very big step for them to step along and, uh, and introduce themselves to the Sailing Champions League and will be a real eye opener. But it's also all credit to all the rest of the teams. It shows the caliber of racers that are here that you can't just turn up for the first time, jump in and go, oh, we'll do all right. So, uh, yeah, pretty tough at the top. And as well as what they learnt on the water, they can also learn a lot by digging back through the SAP sailing analytics. And um, I know that uh, a number of the sailors in the Olympic scene and the extreme sailing series 
um, use this analysis on a regular basis to, to try and analyze their races and see where they're going right and where they're going wrong. Well, exactly that. That's what we use here in the commentary booth, and it's uh, available to you all out there at sapsailing.com. Um, we did do uh, a few little uh, tester bits how to talk through, so if you missed them, feel free to, once uh, this live uh, view goes up as a highlight, then scan back and uh, find those sections, and you can learn a little bit about how we're using those analytics. But it's a great way to go and find it. Of course, lots of information about the Sailing Champions League on Facebook. Head to Sailing CL and you'll be able to catch up on all of the highlight clips, some of the interviews, some photos that have been taken over the last sort of few days. And of course, it is the way to keep track of the next semi-final. So this is the end of semi-final one. We've got semi-final two coming up in St. Petersburg from 3rd to 6th of August. So that will be in Russia um, just about a month or so after uh, Russia's hosted the Football World Cup. But then the, 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 the real big one comes in 3rd to 6th of August, the second semi-final, when we get um, the, the next bunch of uh, 12 or 14 qualifiers go through. And, and then the final, I think it's maybe 32 teams go through to Samaritz uh, for the finals of the Sailing Champions League at the end of August. So that will be the, the big showdown on the, uh, the lake in Switzerland. And it will be... A clash of the titans. We see a titan heading out to sea. One of the huge motor yachts and super yachts that we see moored in Porto Cervo. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, makes it so special to be here. Corky, um, I've enjoyed every part of this, uh, of this last few days, even commentating with you. Um, well, so I don't often say very that. Very kind, <laughs> kindly said and nicely put. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for watching, and uh, we hope you join us again for St. Petersburg and then for the finals in St. Moritz later on this summer. Uh, but this is me, Andy Rice, and Corky Rhodes, over and out from semi-final one in Porto Cervo.